part of the paper is pre-printed and um, the rest is soon to come where we kind of are demonstrating this for, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> where we've been demonstrating this. And let me also get out of the way. Oh my gosh. All right, can people see now? And if not, I like they couldn't before. Uh, okay. Um, um, and yeah, so, it, it, you know, we, where we introduced the more streamlined version of the protocol, as well as some showcases with some newer instruments. All the original work was on, uh, really done on the QE Basic, um, which was great. And still is a good tool if, you, if that's what you have in your lab. Um, you can kind of do all of these workflows on those. Um, why are we, you know, what were the considerations for, you know, if you want to get started in single cell sample prep, um, why are we kind of using the cell in one, this fancy machine, and, and kind of what are all the reasons? Um, you know, it's uh, you know, in addition to the automation, um, which is which is really nice and allows you to kind of get more robust, consistent results and have more hands-off time. Um, this is kind of the best way we could think to you know, again, to design a flexible way that allowed us to pool any number of single cells together um, and scale up a different way. And I guess I mentioned a lot of this. Um, and so these are the considerations that went in and, and you know, the small volumes that we're using, um, which you kind of saw again in the last presentation, um, it's nice for kind of minimizing sample losses. I think the key advantage really is minimizing the number of reagents that we're adding to the droplets in the samples. Um, we just have to add, you know, 20 nanoliters of a mass tag. When we're scaling up the number of TMT tags we're using or other mass tags um, in the future, to 20, 30, 50, maybe hopefully one day, um, you know, adding those small amounts allows you to still have like really clean samples. Um, and in the early days when we were doing this in the plates, the samples, you know, it worked well in some ways, but the chromatography like would look really gross. And if you wanted to run like hundreds and hundreds of samples back to back to back, you're gonna like run through your columns a lot faster. So these small volumes really make the samples a lot cleaner. We're not doing sample cleanup. We just do on direct on column injection, but all these things um, are all kind of benefits and design considerations for why we're doing things kind of the way we are. Um, and again, you've seen the workflow um, and you know the last step as you saw was pooling samples, dispensing them into the plate. I'm not gonna play this, you just watch this. Um, and so now that we've taken our samples, as you've seen, put them in the plate you know, and sealed it and we were dried it down um, for kind of storage, we waited a month, maybe our mass spec was broken our mass spec is fixed, we're gonna take the plate out of the freezer and um, rehydrate the samples just in like a microliter of um, DDM and, and 0.1 formic solution. And uh, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Christoph, who's going to go take you to the mass spec and show you um, a little bit more and give you a lot more detail about uh, running the mass spec samples on the Brooker SCP instrument. Um, this instrument is really what we're using for most of our multiplexed um, DIA workflows, uh, especially you know when we're analyzing individual single cells. It has a super bright ion source, really really high, and the TIMS gives really high you know efficient ion utilization. And this has um, been really great for kind of being able to identify more proteins in smaller and more limited samples um, when we're kind of directly analyzing cells with with DIA. Um, so yeah. Without further ado, I guess let's head over there. All right. Um, so, um, I guess most of you know how a mass spec looks like and what it can do, I, I assume. Um, so, this is the Tim Stuff SCP. Um, so, the predecessor of the Tim Stuff Ultra, there were a few changes made going from the SCP to the Ultra. Um, but in terms of sensitivity, we are in a similar ballpark. It's just with, with the ultra, we get 30% more at the low end. Um, but still, it's a, it's a good instrument to be used for single cell analysis. Um, so we have the instrument here, and it's always connected to an LC. Um, as you know, this is the, um, the Brooker um, LC, the Nano Loop 2, um, where we would like to do an injection from so we we have our auto sampler arm and we have our gonna be our auto sampler drawer um, we can freely configure what kind of um, plates or file trays we want to use for freely is an overstatement so you have three settings for either 384 or 96 12 plates you can't go higher what is it 15 or 
that one. <laughs> Put the four times 384. Um, because the needle is too wide, so you can't really do the pickup. It would uh, block the, the, um, the port, basically, and when you try to suck up your sample, um, no air will go in, and so you can't really inject from those plates. Um, but 384 is absolutely fine oh, while I had it open. So what we have on it right now is the self-adhesive foil. I'm not the biggest fan uh, on it, but quite a few LCs have issues with the self-adhesive foil because you have quite a bit of glue from the inside and it might get stuck on your autosampler needle um, or you carry it somewhere and you mess up your system a little bit. So what we typically use are these um, ceiling foils, which are mounted on my, my heat. So you can either use the um, conventional like heat sealer um, or uh, I think PCR cyclers can be used as well, um, but the, the normal ones are probably better. Depending on what plate type you use, the 96 ones, they're also the zone free uh, ceiling foils. Um, which can also be used. They're adhesive or self-adhesive, but they have the glue only on the outside and not over the, the actual well from the 96 well plate. They're not available for the 384, but for the 96, they are available. But I just want to make sure that I put it in the right way. Yeah. <laughs> it is doing something. Okay. Anyways, um, I think there was still a sample running. Um, sure. So yeah, as I said, we want to inject from a uh, um, 384 well plate, and there are different options to inject basically your sample. Um, in this case, now we have the sample in solution and would then specify to inject, um, I think we have in total two microliters. We can say either we inject one microliter or we inject two microliters. And the settings we have in the method, we are actually able to take exactly um, the two microliters out of it. How that works, I can show you later on. And um, we can also um, dry our sample. So then it's more stable because um, most people are concerned when you have your sample in solution for a longer period of time because each analysis takes its time. It takes a while. Um, here, I guess, uh, the gradient we are using is half hour long with loading and everything. We are closer to 45, 50 minutes to sample, meaning um, to run a 384 well plate, it, it takes some time, right? So you don't want to keep your sample in solution because things can happen. You can hydrolyze salt and bond, um, stuff, stuff can evaporize and, and things like this. So you can also dry your sample and then resuspend it just before you want to um, inject it. And with the auto sample arm, you can actually do that. If they take a certain volume from a certain vial in, in the wash position here, they specify the vial position. You take one microliter, two microliters, five microliters, um, whatever volume you want. You bring it to your sample vial. You release the, or you, you dispense the, the solvent, let it sit for half a minute, let's say, and then you go in with your auto sampler needle again, you take half of the sample, pipette it up, pipette it down a couple of times. I typically do it five times to, to make sure you re everything in, um, of your sample. And then you take the entire sample and load it onto your collar. So by that, yeah. Yeah, you can set it up. There are special dissolve uh, methods for this. I can show you how that yeah. looks like. And, on the system. Yeah. and so it would basically always redissolve your sample just before you um, start the analysis, which is quite helpful. The only thing I would recommend is when you dry your samples, especially at tiny amounts like single cells, um, to add an antioxidant to, um, to your samples, because um, I, I've noticed that when I dry tiny amounts, like a nanogram and lower, I see that oxidation of methionine goes through the roof. So you have a lot of oxidation here. I think um, I had ascorbic acid. Sigfine? Ascorbic acid. A vitamin C. It's good for us, good for our samples. So, um, um, so I haven't really 
tried a lot of different concentrations. It, it worked well for me with um, 20 millimolar concentrations and I added a microliter to your sample. So you, you have tiny amounts and the scorbic acid shouldn't really interact with the 18 material. It should be washed through when you load your sample. I haven't really seen an adverse effect on like uh, column stability or mass spec stability of infected. So I think we... Wait, sorry, can I put this one? Yeah. No, no, I added before I dry the samples. So you, you could either do it at the end of your um, protocol. So when you resuspend your sample, you could do that with um, um, 20 millimolar um, phobic acid in the pipe, something like that. You reduce it and then dry it out. Okay. Talk with him. It's sweet or hard. It's hard to cut out. Wow. All right. Um, Sorry, it's actually, um, good. I, I actually just stopped this one here. I think I forgot to stop it. I just wanted to have a blank running while uh, we had lunch and, and things like this. I just stopped it. So, um, just to, to show you how to get started, basically, I mean, on the, on the instrument, what you do or have to do is on a frequent basis, uh, is to calibrate the system so that the, the cost um, is nicely calibrated but also because it's a tim stock we we focus also on iron mobility but the iron mobility part is also calibrated it's actually fairly easy to do there are only a few steps um for this i go into the software it's called um tim's control and here you basically see the, the live view i just start a bit of flow sorry um You actually have a live view of what is flowing into the mass bag at, at the moment. So you have your M over Z scale here, you have your I mobility um, up here. And we measure in 1 over K0, that's our way of expressing um, the collision and the short section. And since we do um, trapped I mobility, how that works is we have a gas stream from the back, pushing our molecules into um, the, the TIMS cartridge. And um, we have an electric field to trap them at a given position in the, in the gas space. So the, the bulkier um, your molecules are, the further they are pushed inside because they, their um, projection in, the, in a three-dimensional space is uh, much larger than when you have a tiny molecule. Um, so you basically separate them out by in over D or by mass, but also by size. And depending on the, the heavier your molecule, the ballistier it probably, so they will be further inside in the, the TIMS cartridge. And so you trap them in the field, and then you slowly reduce your electrosphere to denote the molecules one by one. And then those get, get analyzed. And you have different modes. So right now we are looking at the MS1 trace, basically, so whatever is going into the instrument in, in the range here, which we, we've selected, it's from 1, 000, uh, 100 to 1,700. So everything, that's what we see. But we have different scan modes. Um, and one of it is data independent acquisition, or DIA, where we define certain mass ranges to be analyzed um, by MSMF. So you, you isolate a certain range, you apply a collision energy and collect spectra for it. And this is basically how it looks like. And what we try to do is to cover a certain range. I might go to, to a different program first to show you that. So, Felix, let a few things out of the way. So that would be a typical run where we have our, uh, this is our base peak chromatogram down here, the range here. And this would be the same I mobility view which we had in terms control. So M over Z on the X axis, X axis and the I mobility up here. And each individual dot would be one peptide or precursor flowing into the mass spec. Now this is the, the sum of whatever was inside. And you see that you have a strong independency of M over Z with, ion, with your 1 over K0 value that um, 
your molecules of interest are somewhat here in this range. These are doubly charged, triply charged peptides, and you want to focus on most of these. Everything up here is thinly charged, and um, for peptides, this is not really important for us. Thinly charged peptides with um, the mass around 400, probably three amino acids long, sometimes four, they're not really helpful in giving up an identification because um, you can find those combinations of four amino acids in a lot of protein. So that's not really important for us. So we try to focus on, on these ones. These are the doubly charged, doubly charged ones. So they are much longer, six, seven, eight, 20, whatever amino acids. So um, they are more meaningful. And that's what we then also try with um, our um, scheme of um, isolation. So we, we, we have certain accumulation time, we say whatever flows into the mass spec, accumulate this for 100 milliseconds, push it to the next uh, ramp there, and then elude it one by one. And we define certain ranges per ramp to be analyzed. So we, we, we would include everything in the range 800 to 825 in a certain high mobility phase. Then when there's, the, I go back to, to this view again. So we would say, 800, 825 in the range where there are molecules. Then we switch our quadruple to this range, 600, 625, uh, analyze what's eluting here. Then we switch the quadruples to 400, 425 to select those. We're basically, we're making use of the separation and the sequential illusion that we can switch our quadruple position within one analysis cycle to analyze more in the same time. Right, and, and basically to visualize this, what I just do, I reduce the collision energy here and switch from the MS to the MS2 mode and I'll make it a bit more dynamic. So this is basically what is being um, isolated in the 25 Dalton window that we select at different eye mobility. Brained. Right, and um, right now it's without collision energy. That's why you only see um, signal in in this right. Just to visualize that we are basically mimicking what we see here. Right, this is how the mass spec scan through. And when you see the um, trajectory here, it's basically the same slope of um, where we have our molecule here. That we follow this trajectory basically. Sure. Right. So I just load the method again. Um, changes. So that's how it looks like when we apply collision energy. So you see, um, like, signals appearing at lower MOVD because we are fragmenting something. Right now we, we only have, like, background there, but um, we would then start fragmenting fossil and collect peptide spectra. Right, so to get meaningful data, we have to make sure that our talk is calibrated and the gym is in the right range. But if the gym is shifted, our range of collection would be outside of the range where our molecules are, and then of course IDs will go down. And that can't work. Right, for guesses. Yeah, I'll show you that. So. Um, Right now, what we do here um, is we have, this is our source. Our column sits here. It's basically um, closed. Um, and we, we only draw air in through this filter here, basically. And you can see when I put my finger on it, nothing will happen because now it's, there's a vacuum inside and there's no sprite. Take my finger away, the signal comes back. And right now, the air that we are drawing in is fairly clean because it goes through an activated carbon filter. When I take this off, the room air gets in, and you see all the contaminants we have in the air. There are a lot of, and there are polyethylenes in the air coming from the paint, from the floor, from the odorants, whatever. Um, other contaminants might fly in, and we actually make use of these contaminants and calibrate our system with it. So we don't have to really infuse any tune mix or something. The only thing we do, we have 
an additional filter here. So the, this white filter we just use to um, store some of um, the tune mix masses on it. That's something that gets delivered with the instrument. You can spike it on, leave it on the filter to store it basically, and now I put it on without the activated carbon filter. So we have the room air contaminants plus some masses we use for calibration. So there, there should be a 622, a 922, and a 1222. And that's something we have in our tune mix solution as well. And we can use the sun for calibration. Please. So we go to the calibration tab. And here are different reference tables where you can select from. And the, here, this one is the in-batch calibration, how, how we call it. And it has some of the common room contaminants um, on it. Um, I just click calibrate, and there are some which we don't need here. Um, these are certain polysiloxanes, or this is an um, layer made. Um, so I, this is not present, so I remove this one, I remove this one, and I probably also remove this one. Now we should actually see some masks here, but I think we had this earlier today as well. I think the intensity might be a bit too high. Um, bit. Try again. So I want to achieve a good score, right? So you have your signal here, it's being selected, there's nothing else around. And you see this value here and the I mobility value, like if it's just this really present. Um, that one looks good at selecting the right one. The score is good. Um, so if we click accept, but the chocolate's not calibrated. I take this one off again, put the other filter back on. But right now it's important to have the ion mobility in the right range. And with the filter being off, um, the gas intake is different. Um, that's why the position in ion mobility would be a bit um, off. So we have to make sure that um, we, we tune or we calibrate under the correct conditions. And so we still see the um, the lock mass is here, that's still present. It takes some time until they disappear. Um, and we can use this to, to check if everything is okay. And we, we know um, the compensation voltage. Now, um, okay. right. Oh. Okay. Um, it, it won't let me toggle a bit right now, but when you click on this, um, it actually shows you um, the compensation voltage. But it can happen that sometimes it gets stuck, I think because I stopped the acquisition. Um, unfortunately. So you would see the uh, compensation voltage, I don't want to shut it down and restart it. Uh, you would see a compensation voltage of 132 for this molecule, and that's where you want to be at. So for this, this this one, it would be 160, and you use this then to calibrate. You know already what uh, one hour K zero value you, you would get, um, and then you you calibrate um, based on those three masses with a linear fashion because I mobility behaves linear. They calibrate. You click on the Baffled and it selects the correct ones, we say then accept, and the probability would be calibrated as well. So, in case of those values aren't at the correct position, we have um, two valves down here on manifolds where you can change the pressure inside the TIMS cartridge, inside the funnel where things are going into the mass spec, and you can adjust it accordingly. Well, we have to tell you first. Um, the basic, the, the trough we say should be stable for a week, should be recalibrated once a week, but I always say um, it doesn't really take a long time to calibrate. 
So I would always do it before I start a larger batch of sample. If I just run a quick check, I don't calibrate. But if I have like 20, 50, 100, whatever samples, it doesn't hurt. Just do a quick calibration and make sure that it is stable. With the eye mobility, it is fairly stable, but you see fluctuations based on weather conditions, for example. So if, you, if you're coming from a high pressure system and you have a storm moving through, pressure, atmospheric pressure drop, you also see a drop in um, your eye mobility. So you have to um, change the, the valve positions a little bit to make sure that you're back in the, in the range where you want to be. But um, it, it is not that it's completely drifting away. It's by an angle. But that as well, I will see it on a regular basis whenever you start in the middle. Yeah, it's really like installed standard thing. A deflation that probably validates or is the first spell. Um, that should be good enough. Because right. you have quite wide tolerances for this, so you don't need to be 100% on this value. And even those wobble a bit around, they are sometimes a bit higher, a bit lower, but you, your windows are wide enough to account for this. But yeah, um, you shouldn't be too far away because then you you cut out half of your iron cloud basically. Right, so this is now done. And um, now we are actually ready to, to uh, write our queue. And I'm a bit lazy, so I just copy something from above. And earlier we did the experiment. We had two microliters in the plane and we wanted to, or in, in, in one file position, and we wanted to make sure that the two microliters were actually injected. So it's 250 picograms, but we injected two nanoliters, uh, microliters. So it's actually 500 picograms. Um, and there are different modes, right? So the, the first way of injecting, this is where you have your sample in solution. This is our typical gradient. We have here a 25 centimeter ion optics column. Um, it's in a column oven. We call it column toaster. Um, it's grounded here to make sure that you have deep spray with the ion optics column. You have to ground it at the at the end. And because everything is grounded, you can actually capture it. It's not that you get zapped or something. Um, you can touch whatever you want. Nothing will happen. Um, so this is configured now as a standalone, but you can also connect it to the nano elu to have a direct control of the temperature in here. But if you have the standalone version, you can change temperatures by pressing this button here and you have preset configurations at 35, 40, 50 and 60 degrees. Whatever that's in Fahrenheit, I can do. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you can freely or you can set either of those for temperature setting or when you have it connected to the LC, you can actually put something in between as well. Right. So the, the column is um, 50 degrees right now, meaning um, the back pressure should be good enough to do a fairly decent or quick way of loading, we, but we always inject directly onto the column. We can also configure the trap here to do trap elute, but for low sample amounts, it's not really recommended um, because we do um, back flush um, trapping basically. So we load in one direction and we load in the other. And that can cause some issues. And also the inner diameters of the tubings, they are not really optimized for a low sample amount. So you have a bit of um, solvent mixing and things like this. So you get wider peak. So you would need to have a trap that releases your peptides a bit earlier so that they get refocused on the analytical column. So that's why we are not doing that. So we, we take the longer loading um, and load directly onto the collar. Right. And so then we run this 22 minute active gradient with washout and everything. It's 90 minutes, uh, 30 minutes. And we always finish on high organic because in our routine, what we, we do is we always start with a, um, a separation column equilibration because that's more efficient to do that at a higher flow and a higher pressure. We, we do that at 800 bars and we use four column volume to equilibrate the column. 
So that's, this is being done while the auto sampler is taking the sample. And then we go to the sample loading and we specify that we use um, twice the specified sample volume plus one to make sure that the, follow, uh, that the sample is actually uh, loaded on the common. Right. And then for pickups from um, 384 well plates, what we specify is a certain retraction height. Um, so we, we say then once the needle, because the needle goes into the well, goes all the way down to the bottom, recognizes it's the bottom of the well, and then it retracts typically by one millimeter. Um, but that's too much for the 384 well plates. Therefore, a sample is right at the bottom, and you only have one or two microliters. So if you go up one millimeter, half of your sample won't be taken because the needle is too high. So that's why we say 0 0.5. And 0 0.5 is typically good that you can actually say um, you take the entire sample. Yeah. Yeah. And up to the salt. Um, it should be fine with the default. The only thing is really when you want to inject from plates and you want to inject everything, then you should change the um, the needle height, uh, the rec uh, the retraction. It up starts. No, no, you can freely choose the belt, uh, the welds. What do you want to do? Um, the, this is then done here. Basically, you have this drop down, and you can choose whatever position, and you can toggle between the two different position caps. Um, then, basically, what you have to do, um, let me see if I can do it without closing high stump. Um, let's go in the view only mode. That's the configuration, and you have your LC and uh, I can't, I, I don't see it here. Um, but basically in the configuration tab, um, you can change what you want to have. So you can either inject from a via tray, a 96 well plate or a 384 well plate. Or now you can also inject from the Prodeo chip, the labor free Prodeo chip. Um, you can do the pickup from there as well. Uh, and, and that's being done in the configuration. Well, then here you can also change configurations, um, but you, you have to specify it first in the hardware configuration and then in the software configuration, configuration what you want to inject from. Right, so this is then basically where we want to inject from. It's position three in the plate. There are the two microliters of 150, uh, 250 picograms per um, microliter in there. We specify a name. We say, save it in this folder, use this LC method and use this PIA method. And then it would start the acquisition in terms of, this is basically then, uh, it looked at the, the acquisition method and, and start acquiring the data. All right, so, um, uh, I just save this one and I say start. Swap. Yes. And now it prepares um, the injection. So it would start flushing the, um, well, first it starts equilibrating the column and start um, then washing the auto sampler needle and takes the sample. That takes a little while. Um, in the meantime, we can go a little bit through um, how the data look like and what information you can um, read out of it. So um, I think I have a few things off, uh, open here. Uh, so this is actually how then a uh, flex DIA um, analysis would look like. So you see the, the different um, water or the different isobaric text. So when um, Let's say I just click on the one feed to the flag. How one here? I just it out. So this is all on. I already saw the wrong light. 
Tell me where I start in the film. I'll like open my a little bit. Yeah, let, let's do it like this first. So when you do a flag PIA experiment, so you have, let's say you have three different cells. You have your mass tag, your M track label attached to it. Um, the zero, the, the four, and the is above eight. And that's how it would look like in eye mobility. So you would separate them by by mass, but they would appear at the same eye mobility because the the tag is the same and the, the shape of the uh, peptide is the same. So you you basically identify directly by looking at it. Oh yeah, that's a a free flag label um, peptide and should be analyzed. Right, but um, Absolutely. since we are in in a DIA mode. Um, the high departing soil, soil ever. That's interesting. That that would really match. Anyways, um, but yeah. So refresh. Let's zoom out here again. So as I was saying, we we walk through these combinations and acquire the data, and basically then we need computational tools to to dig into these data because the more samples you have, the more um, complex it gets and that's something that Rupo will explain to you later on how we actually extract all the information out of it and what it's for, what to look out for. Um, like, but yeah, um, I think this is a somewhat nice looking one. I found it disappear. Thank you. Box or box. Right, so here you basically see it's 571, 575 to 579. And because of M over D, it's doubly charged. Um, the difference here is 2 times 2. We are at um, plus 4. Difference from here to here. Show 2. Oh, wait, this one is 4. Sorry. Then this is thingy charged. Sorry, I, I was a bit too quick. Um, this is a thinly charged molecule from here to here, from here to there. Um, it's basically that plus eight, yeah. or it's, it has two labels, the light thin effect. So then you would have the N terminus label and the, uh, the side chain of the lysine. So that's why you have plus four and plus eight, because it's a doubly charged molecule. It shouldn't be a thinly charged one. Better. Yeah, so the difference here is 0 0.5. It's a doubly charged one, but it, it has that the end terminus label than the flight chain of the light beam. Oh, yeah. So this is just on the MS1 level. The MS2 level would look a bit more complex than this. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if we have this. Uh, this yeah. so, how? Uh, it can. So, where are we? All right, you be how can that part of it? I think that you did. Big dog. Same. Well, that ball is being injected now. Dust and fires. Bit did make it pull. Yeah. It actually kind of quite. See, there is now a hole in position. Uh, right. Very specific we can buy. No, um, this is the Eppendorf twin tech um, protein low binding. We have one of the eat the um, aluminum foil. No, but you can get this from Eppendorf as well. Yeah, they have the uh, heat sealing foils. Um, that's what we use typically in Brainerd, and they work quite well. They seal it nicely. But yeah, a speed from your finger. No, you didn't use other two players. This bad for cost. And these are the conical ones. Yeah. And the, the system is now ready or it's done with the injection. So those ones. The PCR like only one. There should be no volume left. I guess if you look compare it to position four, you should see still two microliters in position four. And nothing yeah, anything is like yeah. it's always hard to see it. Sometimes it looks like oh there is no sample, but no, it's actually not. 
So it, it took the two microbeacons, which we have specified. In the bus. Then right now it switched the valve and it's pushing the sample into the loop and now it switched back and um, starts eluting, it starts transferring it to the column. So we here have only two um, pumps, one for aqueous buffers and one for organic buffers. So when we load sample, we use a different flow path Very. from the valve. So we, we go this way. So we are not going through the flow sensor, but just by pressure, we go through the loop and load our sample onto the uh, column. Once this is done, we switch this groove here to this position and start eluting or start forming the radiant. So A and B will meet here in a mixing piece. This is basically this thingy down here. And um, we'll start eluting samples from Oh, or peptides from the color. Nah, right. I guess it's now done with the extraction. I can't to start. I have this. And I. You. They were both there. I think. No, no. I was hoping to see some, some nice spectra, but um, you see some fragments here, but with Flex DIA, um, your MSMS can get really complicated because you have some fragment ions which are exactly the same in all three peptides, some are different, but this, to identify this, it's, it's a bit more complicated than typical labor three experiments, so that's why you need certain settings in um, in your processing software to actually account because you would need to assign the same fragment to different versions of the same peptide, right? And that's a bit more complicated uh, on a computational level. Um, but yeah, that's something that Luke will address later on. Um, what else do we have? When, when do we have to go over? Oh, okay. So there's still time. All right. Did you talk that much, not? Like, for you step in there, they like to do it? Um, not yet. <laughs> not for you, but for the thing. Um, with Spectrum now, it's also a bit more complicated. Um, but, um, Luke, uh, Andrew will show, um, the workflow in Diane. So Diane 1.81 can handle it. And the beta version as well. Spectrum not, I've tried it, but it's a bit more complicated to set it up, but it works as well. But you have to make sure that you're not extracting the, the false information because the um, Spectrum not is not developed for those kind of applications. So it's a bit more manual when you expect the information and you have to um, exclude certain things and things, but it can be processed through it. Yep. No, it's, um, the Tim's Diane version on Proteoscape is based on a previous um, uh, Diane version and this version wasn't able to do that and I, I think our bioinformatician, they have already expanded it. And, um, but yeah, with, with the standalone Diane version, you can do that. But you say that the different maybe a few different aspects of the chemically the flavor maybe just guys the page Um, the so we we try to to analyze everything what's in here and you see that your precursor is still intact, but you also see that some of your your fragments these are water local or things like this they also come in the in the pattern right and for some. Um, okay. Where am I? Let me zoom out again. What's all? And even here for some fragments. So here you don't see the, the actual um, tech DIA pattern. Because you only have a label on one side or on the other. So the, this fragment then is not distinguishable. 
from the three um, good uh, Amtrak labels operating reduce. Yeah, so you have to make sure that your software you do big understand um, how it looks like. So that's why it needs certain setting. Sure. Yeah, certainly being really big, but by then you have that. Like, yeah. So the way um, you do the analysis here is you use MS2 for identification, and you use the MS1 level then for one station. Because then you don't run into this issue that you use a certain fragment which might be representing all three peptides, or or you have to find those fragments that are unique to a certain uh, Amtrak label. So that's why you do the MS1 base. Yes, correct. Yes, but you wouldn't run this in, uh, in DIA. Because then you have the issue that you have multiple precursors in the same um, isolation window, then you can't really track back to um, where those fragments were or the reporters were coming from. How could she be? Yeah, what? Is that faulty? So for TMT multiplexing on these systems, due to the resolution of the trough, we do not recommend to use the 13C, 13, uh, 15N um, label, but what we typically do is we use a subset of it. So from a 18 plex, we would use the 125 plus all, all um, 15 N channels, for example. So you could do a 10 plex out of the 18 plex, or you could do two nine plexes if you want. When you use the other channels, it's just you need to remember how to pull, and you can do that way. But that's it. Is but um, I think right. Uh, under proteomics condition, we are at 40 volume roughly. Um, our resolution is higher at the higher M over Z, and it kind of goes slightly down at lower M over Z. So that's why we say um, with um, 30C, 15N, you might not see uh, the right pattern there. Yeah, the large All right. Um, so while the sample, uh, is being injected and it is almost done. It takes a little bit still. Um, I just want to show the this whole sample method. So in, in terms of um, what we specify here, everything is the same. The only thing we change is in the advanced settings, we activate the default sample functions. Then um, there's also derivatized or dilute, so you can have a higher concentration, the volume there, put it into a certain vial and dilute it with certain buffers uh, to get a, a lower concentrated stock to each, for example. Refine. Yeah. 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 So how this looks is uh, you have, you define in which trade position, which vial it is, where you want to transfer it, and what the dilute should be. Um, so you have to change a couple of settings. And for the dissolved, so we we have to define um, the solvent volume that we want to inject. And I, for 384 well plates, I typically use uh, two microliters um, because then the volume is large enough to basically do the, the mixing as well. Um, you define from which vial from the wash station you want to take it. Okay. One would be the one far in the back. Right. Um, the penetration depth into it. Um, I think when you set this to zero, it would do bottom sense. That's what I did as, here, as well here for the well position. So zero means bottom sensing. Then you go to the actual well. You go to the bottom, retract a little bit, you release. Your sample with a certain speed. I use 30 microliters per second here. Um, I leave it there for 30 seconds. Then the needle goes up and down up into the sample again, takes half of the sample, 
mixes it five times, and then takes the entire two microliters and injects it. But it would only take the two microliters. Um, if you want, you can take a picture of it if you want to set it up if you have the nano in here. But um, other than that, I you know, intend on getting this. Sure. Perfect. I'll just the back. It's still like, oh, no, how many scopes? So, how much more do you need to wear? So here I, I use my two micrometers. Um, no, so for uh, yeah. the 384, you want to make sure that yeah. you have a large enough volume to also get the things that might have been stuck to the wall. Yeah. And I typically use um, uh, DDM for resuspending it. So uh, the your multi the detergent to what you also use for lighting your cells. I think they used it here when they demonstrated um, the PAC DIA workflow. Um, we also add it to our samples to make sure that um, um, we recover most of it and do not lose a lot um, of peptides to hydrophobic surfaces. And yeah, I typically use it at 0.015% PDM. In what? In, uh, I use FA water, so not uh, 0.1% FA. What I use, and then take the two microliters and uh, it's suspended. Oh, yeah. So it is, when you do this, it is important that you specify the correct volume which you inject. So right now we are injecting two microliters because we want to inject everything. But when you use the solve and you dissolve it in two microliters, you also have to specify to inject two microliters. If you specify one microliter here, it would dissolve it in two microliters, but would only take half of it. Right. This is something to keep in mind. Now. It's copy. Right. So this is about to finish, I think. The 17 minutes when you have the larger volume. So it could take four microliters, for example, then it takes even longer. So it's redissolving your sample or the volume you have your sample in, it is always a trade off between loading time and, uh, um, yeah, what volume you can actually handle your sample in. And, um, yeah, that's the disadvantage of loading directly onto the column. Having a trap in between, this process would be much, much faster. But, of course, it, it always comes with um, some losses and identifications. But loading is now done. So the pressure is released. Um, then we prime this line here. Once this is done, the uh, illusion starts. Hopefully, we see some bad fights. I <laughs> right. Get, get. right. First day. Any questions? Or did I confuse everyone? <laughs> Good enough. You can start this down. This speed exit. Data transfer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have processing servers where we run our samples on. I don't know how they handle it here, what they do, um, but back in Bremen, we copy it to um, workstations and do the processing there. And we have automated scripts that can do the, the transfer as soon as the acquisition is done. It starts the processing to push it onto a network drive or where, whatever um, location you specify that. Not the cut units. Yeah. That's a little bit up. You know, it's some free goals. Um, yes, whenever you change anything in the um, eye mobility settings, if you go narrower or wider, you need to recalibrate. Um, but it would tell you in uh, in Tim's control, basically, um, this icon here would turn yellow. If you change anything, right? That didn't get it up. Yes. So if you go narrow, that's okay because this range is rated. But if you go wider, then it would turn red and it would tell you you need to recalibrate. The same as when you haven't calibrated it for a week, this one will mm -hmm. turn yellow and say calibration is over to you. Please calibrate. Same for eye mobility, it would tell you that as well. Um, 
Right. And um, Chris, this I. And also, so what we do right now under under two constructors. The stiff. So we have this high sensitivity mode enabled. Means we are tweaking the detector voltage basically a little bit. We are a bit more sensitive, but we amplify noise as well. And when you turn this on, you have to calibrate as well because the detection voltage is different. So it could also be that the maps are slightly different. And as I said, if you change anything here, these are typical ranges where we work in a DIA. Um, but if you go for a DDA, for example, you might work in a different range, a bit narrower. Um, you can, uh, you have to recalibrate item level two. As we can back speaking, um, it, it depends what the type of experiments is. And then when I go in dilution series, I always start at the lowest, work my way up. And then I do a couple of length afterwards to make sure that everything is, is washed out. When I run single cells, I typically try to have lengths between different conditions. Um, because if you run single cell, single cell, single cell, yep. the carryover should be really minimal. But if you have um, 10, um, 10 eggs, reference runs and cells or something like this that I would recommend to run some like just to make sure um, that you're not um, interfering some information from the run before and also sometimes it's good to have a blank to check what your background is so sometimes you have your sample sitting around and something starts growing in there or, or things like this just to know what your actual background is um, it, it is also good to, to do that. Yeah, but fast. But yeah. Um, I wonder if you feel a bit shitty. Say that if you But that's what the gift gives an enough to be a bit strong. Yeah. A very tunnel. You can see it. Then you need to be a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very scared. There. Um, so, what we typically do. For TMT, as I said, we, we reduce it down, but also we do uh, the uh, DDA method, um, where we where we yeah. use little tapping. And maybe I can just uh, create quickly a method. Uh, it's what she and so like the so it's a yeah. There you have a wider spacer. With Amtrak you have um, four Dalton, eight Dalton. So you don't have the issue that you try to distinguish between 13 and 15, uh, 13 C, 15 and of this. We get double deep. Yeah, we, we set actual value to average position in energy, not a, a percentage. Um, but we use the higher collision and we try to have kind of the TMT or in general for TMT, but for TMT Pro, it's slightly higher than. Oh my. See. Okay. Um, right. So. I'm not it. Something at all. I really has that. Yeah, that's fine. You do have to post. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Pretty sure. Okay. Kill it done. Oh, I think I'm What the fuck? What? What? It's top bar discussion. Oh, it's bar. So, this would be a standard DDA method, which we typically use with certain numbers of precursors being analyzed in a certain number of brands. So here we would do 10 rams at higher accumulation time. Um, on the PSOK, on the Ultra, we actually went back to 100 milliseconds because the sensitivity is good enough. And um, But I, I would recommend when you do 166 to reduce the number of, of rams. I typically use five. Shag. 
<laughs> because then your cycle time is massively reduced, right? So I, I went now, so it was 10. So your cycle time is 1.9 seconds. At a half hour gradient, um, you are pushing it already. Um, so that's why I typically use five. Um, so your cycle time is around one minute, uh, one second. And when you change this one to 100, you're at 0 0.64 seconds per cycle time. So you're picking up more precursor. And I think the signal intensity is already high enough, especially on an ultra system. <clears throat> and um, so these are the default collision energy settings that we have. It's 20 e volt and uh, 9 e volt for the highest. It's iron mobility dependent, not um, charge state dependent. <laughs> and for TMT, what we do, we enable the stepping here. And what it does, it adds more information here. So we have two collision energy schemes. One is done for the peptide backbone, basically, to fragment the peptide and get information about your peptides. And the other one is done with higher collision energies. These are interesting settings. These are not the correct settings. Um, but higher collision energies to generate more um, uh, reporter ions. And we don't really care about the peptide backbone. And those two spectra get them merged, so to have both together. So you have the reporter ions, and you have the peptide backbone in one spectrum, and you can then do the um, database searches and then find um, the reporter uh, ratios. Uh, it is uh, typically a higher uh, collision energy used to um, generate um, the reporter ions because you need a higher energy to generate them. And this is done with the second digital energy. So in, in this, for this instance, it would do the ramping twice. So in, it would repeat the same precursor selection in a second ramp and merge the information then on a precursor level together. So you get one spectrum by generating across two individual ramping events. So for the precursors, what we do is, um, the, for the reporter ions, what we do, we change a little bit the transfer time after the collision energy. So I'll see the precursors go through the collision cell that we fragment. And typically, the transfer times are optimized for larger fragments to make sure that we actually get enough information of the larger fragments that we can identify the precursor. But for for the smaller ones, especially the, the reporter ions, um, those settings are too long. So those tiny molecules will be uh, going through and disappear already. So that's why we change the transfer time, reduce it down to 25 microseconds instead of 60 microseconds to make sure that um, we get the reporter static correctly transferred into the top. Yes. As I said, those settings aren't the correct ones for TMT. I wouldn't recommend those. Um, but um, yeah, that can be done in this way. And if you want to have the correct method, you can contact me. I'm happy to share this. Um, but yeah, um, but you have to keep in mind when you do this, your cycle time is multiplied by two because you do the double ramping. And what I typically do, what I do while doing the conference, where I did the 120, the clean method with the PMT, I only did three ramps. It's Alex. 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 So I do three rams, so the cycle time was at 0 0.74 seconds. And you need this, otherwise you're not getting um, enough creepers scheduled within the five minutes. Uh, active gradient.
So I just had to remove the cycle overlap in our advanced settings. So they would then do an MS survey scan after four ramps. And I reduced it now to one. Um, but yeah. Oh, you hurt me. I have to just lovely to myself. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And in addition, what I did as well, I've changed the polygon. Not sure how familiar you are with um, the connection polygon for precursors. Um, but again, based on how our iron, the iron stout is positioned, I just. No. We just need this. Um, depending on our iron cloud, for most of the precursors of interest are in this range. So you can say, I just want to focus on this range here. You can define your boundaries wherever you want to be and um, say only focus in the narrow range because you don't need to trigger anything in this range or trigger anything up in this range. No. And, um, so then really to focus on the important things. And that's what I did as well. I made it quite narrow um, to just cover the range. With TMT, you have to be careful a little bit because of the tech. Everything has kind of shifted slightly upward. Um, that you, so I call it the, the TMT corner in uh, my polygon that I um, actually let's do it like this do something like this because in this range I have quite a few um, precursors as well so that you include them and not exclude couple of stick yeah 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 you can you can um so you, you just say define a new one and then you draw. You could say, I want to include this one. For example, let's so right click and say define for this one. Only. Then the other way around, if you want to focus on uh, maybe 10, when you, when you put it as non cryptic peptide, for example, and you you see that you identify quite a few um, singly charged molecules, you could actually include this range of you, say everything from. So those would give you peptides with lengths of roughly seven amino acids, and then you can yeah. include those as well, but still get rid of those thingy charts, one which won't give you any meaningful identification. Like, yeah, that's basically just the uh, you know, background. It doesn't really matter if it's EDA or DIP. Yeah, it's good. Um, for DIA, it works slightly different. We have different um, modes. So let's just switch to a DIA method. Okay. Sorry. Not optimized for it, that's why I was complaining. You can either use this. So, what I always do is I use existing ones and modify them the way I want them to be because you want to make sure that you use what you the quad switcher. That you are doing, that you are not uh, wasting time. The thing is, you can't go up in high mobility again once you diluted things out of the top already. When you say I focus on this at uh, M over Z, you can't go to 600 and then back to 900 and go to the higher high mobility range again because those molecules are already out of the tin. But you have to wait for the next RAM. Um, to that on like to this type. Yeah. So here you can basically do the drawing yourself. 
I just say, uh, right. Leave it up. Uh, an overlap bar. It is good. You could uh, collect you know, all of the. <laughs> Is this really when you use some existing one? Uh, another. Yeah. I actually, I got even. I got even. It's funny, you can. You can look at the isolation list yes, here, but what you can also do is file, <laughs> then get this, then read for this one. In case you want to lower certain MOV ranges or things like this, or what else do you could do? Uh, is uh, yeah, you can just do this. Yeah, and then you can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, to calculate the variable window placement across your immobility of immobility, the uh, PID VI8, just that. Yeah, I like the previous colors much, much better, but with Tim's Control 4.0, they've changed it a little bit. So the gray, this one here. Alex, should this get muted? So you don't hear from this conference room? I, I, so when we go to this isolation list again, um, so those would be acquired the same RAM. Right? We do eight RAMs or nine RAMs in total. The first one is the MS one. And then we, we do break or two quadruple switches and analyze those in one RAM. And we RAM again, analyze this range, next RAM, next RAM, on, and then we start over again. So we cover 400 to 1,000 MOBD within um, this scene, and um, that's how we get to um, this cycle time here. Right? So in, in case you change your um, eye mobility range, so you're cutting off your range slightly down here, and that's when you see the, the lighter colors. So partially measured, because here you would start at a higher, or you would finish at a higher uh, 1 over k0 value, and not go all the way down, right? Okay. So in previous versions, it was saying, um, you are outside of your range because your window placement is going either higher or lower, and that's why you can't um, run um, your method like this. Um, and now they've changed this, that they just gray out the range, which is not acquired. Okay. So while I was talking, so we are already halfway through the gradient. Let's see if we can actually see some molecule. Hmm. Hmm. I think we have issues with the pickup or something. Somehow we got we can't get the sample on the column. I don't know why. It's not beautiful. So, yeah, yeah, right. but um, the column should be equilibrated, and we had the issue before as well. But I have to look at the system. Unfortunately, I don't know why. Not sure if something is wrong with the sample loop or. Did this happen in the morning? This one? Yeah. Yeah. First, I thought it's the column wasn't equilibrated and um, we lost the sample, but no. Okay. We have to troubleshoot this. <laughs> but yeah. Is there any other file? Yeah, that was um, what we were looking at here. <laughs> Um, again, on, on Friday it was running, so they ran samples on Friday, but today it doesn't like to take the sample. Oh, it's taking the sample, but I'm not sure if the sample is not making it to the column or something else was wrong. But yeah, let's see. Anyways, um, yeah, I think I, yeah. I've talked enough. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess we can head over already and then have a start the break a bit earlier and then you can start a bit earlier so you don't have to stay too long here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you uh, so and so you talked a little bit about running the mass spec. Um, that obviously the Brooker instruments don't work so well for um, the TMT workflows. Um, but so just to give so um, so there's still a little bit more I guess I want to go over in terms of implementing the um, P scope. So these are kind of an overview of the different workflows we have and, and a little bit of information about the cell numbers. Um, you know, with the essentially the more cells we can jam into a multiplex set, the easier it is to prepare. So you'll notice like the cell numbers are the most for the TMT um, 35. If you do all four slides, um, and, uh, and the, and really the reason for this is because you know, say you have a hundred plex labeling and you want to do a hundred cells, you only have to pick up once. It's very quick. But if you have two plex labeling and you want to do a hundred cells, the pickup process is, has gone 50 times and, then, and that takes a long, a long time. And so we could of course jam more two plex cells onto four slides, but at this rate, if you do all these, the pickup takes about five hours. I mean, it, you saw it like in the, in the morning, it, it's super hands off. Like I don't ever think about it. I, I go down halfway through to, to change swap the plates because it actually is 600 samples. So it fills up two, three, four more plates. So you do have to swap the plates once, but nothing ever like kind of goes wrong. So it's, it's very hands off, but it does take a long time. And like 10 hours is like, you're probably not gonna wanna wait around for 10 hours um, for all the solid one runs. Um, so just to give you kind of an idea. So the, obviously the workflow is kind of, you can subdivide into these M-Track workflows where we're doing DIA and then um, the TMT based workflows where it's you know sequential sequencing. Um, you can do DDA and all, of course that's kind of conventional DDA, that's the easiest. Um, and also um, there's the kind of prioritized scope method, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in, in um, essentially it's using kind of real time instrument control to only kind of sequence the protein and peptides that you're interested in. Um, all right, let me, so you guys already got all this sample prep quality control. Josh talked a little bit about this, I'm sure, in the morning, so I'll kind of, um, okay, wait, sorry, this is a bit disjointed, but one thing, so did Josh talk to you guys about a little bit about the, um, cell staining and fluorescence for like cell permeability? Um, cool. Yeah. Just a quick blurb. You, you probably get the gist of it. It's not that complicated, but we did some experiments where we stain cells and we, we recorded the fluorescence intensity. Um, the obvious thing to do is to just exclude those cells, which you can do. Um, but just to demonstrate the effect, we had some samples that were fresh and frozen. And you see with the frozen samples, kind of a higher number generally um, was found to be a high, permeable at a higher clip. And especially one of the cell types was really effective. And um, we've kind of seen this stuff through a variety of different tissue types and, and conditions. And even with cell lines, if you're kind of not careful about how you st uh, store them. Um, and what you see in some of these samples here are from um, tracheal uh, epithelium. And so there's a couple different cell types, some fibroblasts and some epithelial cells, but the real first order observation is that a lot of these permeabilized cells, you know, we noticed are clustering together. So essentially if it's black, the light was on. If it's gray, the light was off. Um, and uh, what you know, what you can see when you compare the permeabilized to the intact is you can see the proteins are preferentially leaking kind of out of the cytosol compartment. Um, these annotations aren't kind of totally perfect, but you'll notice that the mitochondria is, is not very different. And um, for those of you who have looked at a little bit of RNA-seq analysis, the like percent mitochondrial filter is kind of pretty ubiquitously applied in, in these analyses to kind of filter out cells for the same kind of concept. The mitochondria are tied in very tightly inside the cells. And, and so when the, they're not kind of these things living inside, it aren't the first things to go um, when the membrane ruptures and you still kind of have a cell husk there um, or even maybe a cell husk that's only leaked a little bit. Um, and there's kind of some variance on how much, you know, 
um, different cell types, proteins like well, we could a bit differently, but generally the signatures were pretty consistent. Um, so, uh, but obviously the difference between the proteomics and RNA seq is that um, we can do you know our mass spec time is a bit more valuable, and so you know it's good to be able to exclude these things. Um, sorry, some of these slides were assuming that people hadn't seen the sample prep yet as well. So, um, and we talked about this. You get it plate, dry down, storage. Um, one thing to mention is that when you resuspend the samples, um, so they've been dried and stored in the plate for really, in, in the fridge for a really long time, if you, your mass specs broke or something, um, and you take them out, you're ready to run, you just pipette one or two microliters of like a solution of like, a, you know, a bit of DDM and formic acid. You know, the amount that you pipe in is how, how much you want to be aspirating with your mass spec. Um, Unless, of course, you're doing a workflow with a carrier where you'll want to resuspend the carrier amount you're interested in injecting in that same volume and, and you know, dissolved in kind of the same makeup of the DDM and the formic acid, but it'll just, of course, also have your peptides from your carrier. Uh, so, okay. Um, so this is what I started rambling about before I realized I had other slides. Uh, so is it clear to... Have people heard a little bit, or, you know, they're, are they familiar with these kind of two different types of multiplexing workflows that, that are popular in the field, the TMT versus, or yes or no? No is also okay. Okay, oh, great. Um, so um, I suppose people have heard about um, data like independent acquisition versus kind of data dependent acquisition. Um, data dependent acquisition, obviously popular for the majority of time where we sequence you know, it's this top N algorithm, the mass spec stuff flies in, we see the most intense things, and we try to sequence them one at a time. Um, so, you know, you have to take one scan at a time, and this is kind of slow, and, you know, people wanted to kind of multiplex their samples um, because of this, um, but it's hard, you know, uh, essentially to do this, they design these tags that are all the same exact mass, and so you take that, that even if you, if you take 10 different samples and label them with different tags and you combine them um, and you inject them into the mass spec and you see a peak that corresponds to a peptide from your protein of interest, it all comes up together in one peak. And you take that peak, even though it's a superposition of a couple different um, samples together because the tags all have the same mass, they come in together, and then you try to sequence it at the MS2 level, you fragment it, and those tags will break apart differently. And so you have these what they call reporter ions and they'll, you know, they'll measure different relative kind of percentages. And, and, and some, you know, if all the sample, the majority of it came from one sample, you know, that tag obviously would have the highest peak um, relative to kind of the other samples. Um, and so that's one method of multiplexing with this sequential sequencing. It traditionally was done with DDA. Um, we've improved upon that with a kind of way to run the mass spec called P-scope, where instead of taking the most abundant stuff and trying to sequence it, we take stuff where we have some prior knowledge that A, we're interested in it, and B, we'll be able to sequence it easily. You have things like trypsin auto cleavage product, um, which may be really abundant, but you know you, that's meaningless. You don't. It, it's going to buy the so. Um, and there's other things, modifications we might not be searching for. You know, all sorts of reasons why um, why we might want to you know, implement a bit smart. And so this is done with real-time instrument control with a program called Max Point Live, which we're going to kind of go through a bit of a tutorial of um, briefly. The other method is Plex DIA, which you saw a sample prep for, I believe, this morning, or the basics of kind of it. Um, obviously, we didn't have time to do the whole thing. Um, and so this is um, a DIA is the, you know, it's, so we're not, we're se sequencing instead of one peptide, many peptides at a time. Um, but then, of course, this old labeling approach is not going to work because if you, you know, these reporter ion tags are the same for every single peptide. So if you send a million peptides together and you fragment them, you don't know what peptide the reporter ion tags came from. So it was contingent on this sequencing one thing at a time. So we still wanted to multiplex, but we wanted to take advantage of trying to sequence multiple things at a time because you can identify more proteins if you're not limiting yourself to only one thing at a time. Um, and so the mass tags now just actually more simply, and we kind of research cycled a really old product that had been used um, a long time ago, have the tags have different masses. 
So you can actually just see them both at the precursor level and at the fragment level. You can just tell these things apart. Their mass shifted in both the fragments and the original ion, their mass shifted by zero, four, plus eight. Um, so these are the two workflows that we're using in the lab. The benefits of, of you know, you could ask kind of why go with one or the other. The P-scope, um, recently TMT came out with like 35 plex tags. Uh, this is really great. It allows you to do like we've done a thousand cells per day at about a thousand proteins per cell. Um, hopefully some more like the data sets for this will be released super soon. Um, as soon as essentially we get the go ahead to release them from, cause they haven't officially released until I guess ASMS or something. But, um, but we did have the okay to talk about it now. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's great. So you can, you know, um, but, you know, generally the identifications are kind of a bit lower and you have this, um, the data is a bit noisier because you deal with uh, interferences from, you try to isolate one peptide at a time, but you don't always succeed. And because the resolution of the quadrupole, which is what you're doing to isolate one thing at a time, it's not that high. Um, so other things kind of get in with it and these will contribute reporter ions that add a little bit of noise called like co-isolation. Um, so there's some drawbacks. The Plex DIA, especially if you have big cells, you can use DIA to improve the number of proteins that you can sequence. Um, so you have kind of higher protein coverage and the data is a bit more accurate because you're able to kind of use the resolution of either the orbit trap or the TOF to kind of really very specifically kind of see the ion that you're kind of counting and, and interested in. Um, but of course it's much lower throughput because the best we have right now is three tags and um, you can be a bit more accurate. But so there's trade-offs to these two approaches. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about both of them. So Christoph obviously showed you like, and we're using kind of the Brooker instruments. We don't really use the Brooker instruments for the, for the P-scope because the detectors can't resolve the different TMT tags as well. Um, they just, the orbit traps have higher resolution, especially in the low M over C range. And so Christoph showed you kind of the LCMS side of, of how to run these Plex DIA samples. Um, the overall workflow um, is not super complicated and you've heard about this in other talks. A lot of people kind of are doing the same type of thing. Um, you prepare a bulk sample, which you just kind of take some cells, you, you pellet them, you can resuspend them in water or whatever sample preparation method you so prefer. Um, usually we take a pellet, suspend it in water, we do freeze heat, and then we just add the trips in and the buffer, digest overnight, and then add one of the M track labels the next day. And we dilute it to a concentration of about 100 cells worth of protein or peptides at that point. Um, so we use this and we run it. Um, with the same kind of same DIA method is fine, same instrument, everything is the same. You're just injecting out of a vial probably. Um, and we search this against kind of the whole FASTA and um, we generate kind of a, in, we go from this kind of predicted library over the whole FASTA to an empirical library, which contains maybe like five, 6,000 proteins um, that are probably going to be the ones that you're most likely to identify in that sample. Um, and then we use that empirical library to search the single cells. And this is the benefit of reducing the number of hypotheses you're testing in your single cell data. And um, it, yeah, it improves kind of the results you get in your single cells without hopefully missing out on kind of too much specific stuff. Obviously the thing that you really don't wanna do is use a sample to generate your library that is very different from the single cells you're analyzing because then proteins you're interested in might not make it into that more narrow specific library that you might be interested in analyzing your single cells. Um, yeah. So you use like DIA to generate the library, right? We use DIA, yeah. And, 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 and so has anyone used Diane before people have used the search mm -hmm. engine? Yeah. So I, I, last group I went through kind of like a little bit of this process. I pulled up a Diane window. Um, we're a bit limited on time and I feel like the workflow is not too complicated. And um, there's a lot of good videos from um, our lab, like Jason Dirks um, has like a tutorial that you can find on our website of how to have search data um, with uh, Diane. So can we use that challenge or we can only use Diane to use the DIA generated network? Uh, good question. Um, so you can use both. 
You can certainly search. So Spectronaut, uh, you can definitely, yeah. I, I, so we search ultimately with Diane. The reason that we use Diane is because we worked to implement um, some specific functions, I guess, uh, that pertain to, so if you have like multiple labels, uh, like a sample, three single cells that you're analyzing together, um, each protein has kind of three copies. Uh, that one with like, you know, the first mass tag, one with the second and one with the third. Now, these cells might be very different and you might have a protein that's really abundant in one single cell and very lowly abundant in the other two. Now, you know, it might be that that peptide in the other two cells is not abundant enough to give you ample fragments to like make an identification. So if you just ran that cell by itself, you'd never see that protein. But there might be just enough ions to be able to quantify it. You know, there's kind of different thresholds. Identifying something is harder than just measuring how much of it there is because we need enough copies to fragment it seven different ways to get all the different backbones that we need to like stitch together that sequence. And maybe some of our fragments only, we need this fragment, but it's only produced 5% of the time by the um, like fragmentation process. So that means you would immediately need at least 20 copies to even get one single bit of that fragment. Meanwhile, 20 copies is certainly, uh, mass specs have single kind of, these days have near single molecule detection. 20 copies is certainly enough to do quantification. Um, so what we do is you kind of take that sig that you identify the sequence in the first single cell where the protein was abundant, and then you look for Dalton's over, eight and Dalton's over. Do you see anything? And, and, and do you call that? And, and so this is, and, and you know, and we developed um, some, algorithms kind of just a simple classifier to assess what's the quality of that lowly abundant signal. Is it really the exact M over Z we expect? How intense is it? What's the ratio of the first to the second isotope? Do we just think it's noise? Um, so there's like something in Diane called the channel Q value filter, which is kind of the, you can also search kind of these multiplex data with up to three channels in Spectronaut as well, if, if that's what you're comfortable with. Uh, they haven't put as much development into this like channel holding feature. Um, yeah, so that's um, a long answer to your question. I was question regarding the first run that you do with uh, yeah. the first tag. So you use whatever tag, normally the, the, the light one? You, you can use any tag, yeah, normally the light one it works because that's like the way it works is you can kind of just specify the fixed modification of the mass of the zero tag and then in Diane, you add this one command that says, okay, and I want another channel plus four and another channel plus eight. So those, um, it, and, and you never add then uh, this, uh, this bulk sample again to your single cell analysis. So then afterwards, you, know, you only do single cell. Yeah, you only do single cell. Different right. and that um, yeah, there's kind of a lot here, maybe more than I can explain. You. You also another choice is and and Luke Corey from our group presented this a, a little bit on this I think yesterday and towards the end of the uh, day, but you could instead of running three single cells at a time you could make one of those channels a reference channel and and this has been something that you know was immediately obvious to us obviously like from the conception of Plex DIA and also the Man Lab as recently kind of demonstrated I mean they demonstrated this principle um, as well and. Uh, yeah, so it's certainly a good thing to do, especially with smaller cell types um, where it might be hard. Like if you have T cells or something, they're really small, you, you know, it's nice to have that extra channel. Um, and you could also use another like P-scope basque approach. Um, so yeah, I, I don't wanna, since we have limited time, I, I didn't, and there's a lot of resources online, I, I didn't wanna spend too much time getting into the Diane. Um, the P-scope, since there actually are not as many um, resources for this, uh, I just wanted to really quickly kind of log into our mass spec and just very briefly kind of show you a little bit what it looks like if you're interested in doing the TMT workflows. Uh, again, these have a lot of benefits, mostly like the throughput. I mean, if you get up to like two, 3,000 cells a day, all of a sudden your costs are you know, similar to a 10X experiment. And, and these are the things that I think we need to do to really start disseminating the technology to like the broad community. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting biological questions that don't require thousands of cells. 
but a lot of them, it's, you know, uh, people want to analyze and fully sample all the cells in their population. We do single cells because it's hard to enrich and, and you know, we don't always enrich for the right things. Um, so essentially the workflow is very similar. You prepare your carrier, just like you prepare your bulk sample and study label with TMT. You're going to then run your carrier, which is TMT labeled with the DIA method. This is going to give you a, um, a list of all the potential peptides, precursors that you might want to then go and, and tell the machine specifically to go after, um, that you might want to tell it specifically to go after, like when we're, instead of doing this, again, this algorithm where you just take the most abundant thing, we want to tell it specifically what we're confident in, what we're biologically interested in. Um, so first we generate the DIA run, we see everything that we possibly could decide to go after and we get the retention times. Um, we similarly search it in Diane using TMT as a fixed modification instead of the M track. Um, and then at this point we have like a run from Diane from a DIA uh, run with kind of the, all the retention times and relevant animal disease. And uh, at this point, we're going to generate what we call the targeting list. So this is something, let's see, okay. So the targeting list, So the targeting list is something that we're going to eventually load into Max Quant. Um, so I haven't got into this. I will in a little bit. Um, we wrote an R package called Huant QC that is for, um, there's a GitHub with a bunch of information and I'll go over that all in a few, but I'm just going to use one or two functions right now. Um, this is mostly for like doing all the downstream analysis of your NPOP data, um, which we'll get into. But right now there's a function called generate targeting list from Diane. And so all I have to do is simply read in my Diane report file of my TMT run. And I run this one function. This command is just to tell it what minute um, peptides start eluding. So this is like in my gradient, the seventh minute, that's when the first peptides came in and what my, my P scope considers like minute zero. And so I just run this one command and it's gonna go, okay. And so now I have this data frame called targeting list initial, and I'm gonna look it open. And so you can see it has 30,000 rows. So that's how many peptides we detected from the TMT run. This is how many things we have the option to tell the instrument to go after. Um, so you'll see there's a couple of columns, you know, stuff you obviously need, retention time. You know, what's the charge and what's the mass? So those are the two big things that we need, right? Um, and the apex intensity, we wanna know, is this one of the more intense things? Is this something that we need like sensitive DIA methods to see? Or are these things that we could maybe easily get with a data-dependent acquisition method? Um, these two columns, this targeting Boolean, this targeting, if this is true, the instrument will maybe try to send it for MS2 analysis. If it's false, it just will see it and ignore it. Um, this is, stands for real-time correction. Um, there might be a trypsin peptide that we don't want to send for MS2 analysis, but we want to use it to make sure our retention times are aligned and on the right path. path. Um, so, because it, it has to use real time retention time alignment to kind of stay on track. Um, and um, because the retention time will shift some a little bit from run to run, but like you can align it very accurately as, as, as some of you might know. Um, so, and then here's just the protein it came from. The modified sequence is just the sequence with the charge appended at the end. Um, and then we have this thing over here called the priority. Uh, um, now you see a bunch of numbers in here, one, two, and threes. Um, one is the highest priority, two, less important, three, all the way at the bottom. Um, now what are these priorities and how do we get them? Um, so what the first kind of this function does is it looks at everything you got in the Diane run. It divides them into three like tertiary, tertiles based off intensity. Um, so the Top one third most intense things get the first tier. The top middle gets the second tier, or the bottom gets, with the idea being that if something's more intense, we're more likely to identify it generally. Um, but there are some specific things we do. For example, you have RPL 28 and there's 15 peptides. You know, depends on what you do. Maybe you're doing RPL 28 profiling and, and that's great. Um, you might want to get all of those. But generally, like we're trying to get protein abundances, we don't may not care about the 13th peptide. So we just take like the four best ones and we kind of knock those down to the least important tier, or we can tell the instrument not to send them for MS2 at all. 
And this allows us to maximize the number of proteins that kind of we're identifying. Um, and so, you know, you got this, we have this little list. You also might want to increase the priority of things that are biologically interesting to you um, and not just things that are abundant, which is kind of in a way what you would get with the original approach um, uh, with the regular DDA algorithm. Um, but so what we can do is here, if I have the priority tier for things that the protein is in this important list of proteins I've assembled that are related to the biology of my system, make sure the tier is one. We just want to get everything where there's an important kind of, we want to get TCR, we want to get, you know, CD8 and CD4 and whatever. Um, so that's nice. So, because we've done this and we have this list and we'll just, you know, print this to the path where somewhere we can get it from our LCMS computer and just name this something like that. So that's the first step. We'll then go over here. Let's see. Okay. And our explorers named Dora is, okay, so open this up. Um, and this is my mass, this is our mass spec in the lab. This is an Explorers 480. So we'll go to Google. We'll type in Max Quant Live. You can just download here. Um, you download it, put it on your desktop or wherever you keep your software. Um, there is one thing that you need in addition, which is the API license to be able to use this. You just have to like call your local thermo person and just ask for it. They just send you a code and tell you where to type it in. And then that's everything you need for this to work. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in trying it, write that down because the maximum live just will not, um, it'll just crash if you don't have that. It only takes a second, but if you don't know, it can be very frustrating, I suppose. Um, yeah, they should send it to you relatively quickly. It's free and I don't know why they make it so that you need to ask them. But anyways, so we open up the folder with our thing that we downloaded from the internet. We have our API code and we open this executable, very simple. Um, there's a couple, there's three different buttons. This is really, it's pretty simple software. This one, um, which is the instrument that you can see a picture of an Explorus. This is on an Explorus. So I'll click the Explorus and I can connect it to the instrument with this button. Um, I don't actually know if this will work right now. The power shut off in our lab and, okay, it's working. So that's great. So this middle tab is a log. So you can see that what MaxQuant.lab does is it just is always listening to your mass spec. It's recording the information from every scan. It's recording it, it's recording it, you know. Um, and essentially how it works is, you know, if it's C, you, well, we'll get into this, but in your mass spec method, um, the way you activate it is you just set the scan range from like 908 to, 10,004, and if it sees a scan come in with that very specific mass range, it catches and it activates kind of your targeting list and it runs it how you kind of specified. And so this final tab is where you input your targeting list. There's this load button. I can see all the different ones I've made. They're all in here. There's like protocol and 29 flex explorers and all these things. Um, we might want to make a new one for our new project. So I'll click this new button. Um, I click this kind of targeting button here and it opens up this window. Um, really the only thing we need to do here is just click this button here. It says read in stuff, select, it says select evidence file. We're going to select the file that we just made in R where I explained kind of the columns. Um, you then load this in, hit open. Um, we should name the columns a teeny bit better so it automatically detects them. But Modified sequence, it's like, I can't find a modified sequence. Apparently we named it modified, which is, or I we should uh, update this. Retention time, retention dot time, apex intensity. I guess there's a dot in there. It didn't recognize it. Fragment MZ is uh, an important parameter. I, all the numbers are the same. And I don't actually know what it does, but apparently it needs it. And then real time correction. There's this real time correction thing. And the last, the priority list. Oh, sorry. And targeted MS2 is this other Boolean, which is, do we want to send it for MS2, a true or false? I got um, all these things. I'll, I'll kind of update this so that when you, this list gets produced for you, all the names are exactly what they are in Max 1, and then it will um, 
auto detect them and you won't need to sit there like populating all these fields. But we'll continue, hit read files, and there you go. Uh, everything's kind of all set up. Um, you can kind of see here, here's our priority list. There's other cool stuff that you can do if you're interested in playing around. You can actually like change the collision energy that you want for that peptide, say like, you know, you it's a really important peptide. You want to hit it with like three different collision energies just to see, like, make sure you get what you want. Um, there's, you can change the fill times to be specific. You could accumulate kind of longer for maybe things you're more interested in that are more lowly abundant. There's additional settings over here that are about like how the mass spec operates. Um, there's like more comprehensive guides. You're not gonna, of course, remember all of this. And uh, I think you can find like exact instructions on our website and in the prioritize scope paper, um, which was published, I guess, in, in Nature Methods last year. And you can find it also on our website. But just a couple obvious things that we might wanna change. The max injector time, is the MS2 fill time. So maybe we are working with small samples. We wanna set this pretty high. We'll see 300 milliseconds. The resolution, we have TMT, 20, 35 plex, we need to use high resolving power to resolve the tags. So I actually have to change this to like 60K or more. So that's 60,000. And also we wanna incre increase the collision energy for TMT, it needs to be a bit higher. So I'll change that to 33. Um, and then, okay, so that's, you know, I have edited kind of my method a little bit. I've loaded in my targeting list um, and I gave some additional instructions to the instrument. Hit back, I gotta put it in a description. Test two, uh, whatever. And um, this will be method number 1064. Great. Okay, scan protocol was saved. Uh, okay, so that's good. So now it's in here, you can kind of see it. Um, so if you want to edit it, you can just click edit. You could kind of load a new thing in. Um, or you can duplicate a past one so you don't have to kind of set all those settings on the side by scratch every time. Um, so this is, so that's like one component. The other component is the mass spec method. This is really just a, a shell uh, just again. So like Maxmont Live is always listening to your mass spec. We just need to give it some secret codes to tell it to like when to start taking control of the instrument and then when to relinquish control of the instrument. Um, and so you can see in this, mass spec method, usually you'd have something like your MSMS scan and then a DIA scan below or a top, se a top seven scan, like the normal things. Here we just have two subsequent MSMS scans. This first one needs to start from 908 and go to, you know, the amount of time, the length of your um, mass spec method. So here we have a 24 minute method or like peptides are, we're starting at minute seven and the method goes till 31. So 31 minus seven is 24 minutes and that's how long Maxwell Live is gonna take over for. So we just set this to 10, 24, these last two digits. Um, I suppose if you had a 100 minute method, this would be from 908 to uh, 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 1,100. Um, the second one starts at 909 and just specifies the, the protocol that we just like made three seconds ago, the number in it. Um, and you said, what do we make it? 1,064. So then you, we would just need to change this to 1,064. And that's kind of all, all you need to do um, in this method. Uh, the other thing you need to do is, um, you know, make the, the length, the correct length that, that you're using. And your chromatography, you still have to kind of control regularly. Um, you need to kind of set up the gradient you're planning on using, um, uh, you know, something. We just do usually something standard from like, what is 7%? B to 35 or, or, or however. Um, but that's uh, no specific information for that here. Um, you just leave those settings kind of how you want them. Um, so that's the method and then kind of, you'll just queue that up. And as long as you've connected the instrument and max point live, okay, so. Okay, so as long as it's connected, you'll see these green things flashing, it's listening and um, you can also tell because the scans are coming in. And then as long as you run this method, you're good to go. It'll pick up and it'll do the um, search. So that's kind of a brief tutorial. I, just to give you, I mean, that's not going to be kind of, you probably won't remember all those steps, but just to give you a sense of how complicated it is, 
Um, I think things can probably seem like a bit daunting to get started on if, if you're like um, kind of not aware of all the steps involved, but it really is it, there's not too many steps. It, not like a very detailed protocol would, would be. What's the advantage of using Maxon Light here instead of infusion of this, the regular one? With right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, and I definitely didn't get into it. Um, and that was also a question the last time. So um, they set out to kind of um, use inclusion lists kind of for single cell analysis in the project. It was led by <laughs> a PhD student, Gray Huffman, who's since graduated and kind of left all this behind a little bit. Um, but they tried using Excalibur exclusion, exclusion lists, and they also tried working with Math Point Live. And there was always these trade-offs between like, um, there was always these trade-offs between having a big inclusion list and identifying the most things possible and then consistency of identifying. So they would, could make small inclusion lists and get very consistent results, or they could make big inclusion lists and really improve the number of identifications they would get, but they had this trade-off. And so they came up with this kind of prioritized tier system where you can make a big inclusion list and get as many identifications, like maximize the utilization of the mass spec, but also get really high consistency for the things that you are interested in explicitly. Um, and there's a lot more information, I guess, on this in the um, in the paper and, and all this stuff is, uh, like scp.slavolab.net has a lot of the information. Um, and that was kind of the, the, yeah, that was the consideration going in. So um, you can do, you can like kind of run your first pass um, scouting list or sorry, you can run your first pass targeting list that we generated and just set up. You might see that despite some of the things being identifiable in, in DIA, they're kind of, you, you weren't seeing them in DDA. So you can just take that original list and maybe things that were previously on the top tier, you're not seeing them. So you just kind of, you could you can um, essentially fiddle with it a teeny bit if, if you so desire. Um, and we found that, you know, one or two iterations of, you know, taking that list, you know, sending it, uh, you know, trying it and seeing what you get um, improves the performance a little bit. And it only takes you two or three mass spec runs. Um, and if you're doing a large study at AA, it can be worth it um, on the back end. So, so that's, okay. So the point, so now we've done the sample prep, we've run the samples on the mass spec for whatever method you're so much interested in. And uh, just in terms of expectations for results, um, it's really good to have like standards that you're injecting just so you can like benchmark these things, especially with the DIA and, and on like the broker instruments. You just get like 200 picograms of K562 and, and just run these before you start your single cells. Make sure your mask, you know, sensitive proteomics requires your instruments to be in top shape. Um, there's been a lot of strides made by manufacturers in recent years of so kind of keeping them at this point, but you... You know, there's so many things and people who do mass spec. I mean, the things are can be kind of a nightmare sometimes. So um, you just want to make sure that you're up to, up to snuff. Um, and so you want to run your standards, especially with the P-scope for what results to expect. You, you're you going to do these scouting runs on, on care, just your carrier only, uh, if I didn't mention that earlier. So you're not wasting single cell samples when you're kind of refining this inclusion list if you're interested. Um, and... Um, you know, essentially the uh, performance you're getting from this carrier only sample is gonna translate to kind of the IDs you're getting in your single cells. Um, so you might wanna either bump up or decrease your kind of carrier amount if, if you're not seeing what you want to see, I suppose. Um, okay, so that kind of brings me on to the downstream data analysis with this package that I briefly mentioned, QC. Um, okay, and so, um, this is an R package um, with very minimal lines of code, like three or four lines of code. Um, it will generate these HTML reports for you. Um, and you can use these, you can, if you, you know, have a student who's, uh, or you're a student yourself and you've generated some data and you wanna share it on Slack, you can kind of share these files that give a synopsis of, of the, and they, with some important like quality checks to see kind of how things went in your experiment, kind of how the data ended up looking. Um, and, the other goal was really to do this metadata mapping for you. Um, you know, if you have a complex experimental design, you have these multi different tags, we want to randomize them. They're, they're kind of inherently randomized in the, in the design a little bit. Um, 
and you might have a lot of conditions and it's kind of very hard. It might I mean to go do it manually. It'd be very challenging to know like this sample was in label three and run 47. Like, uh, so we want to do that for you. And we also want to provide links to the metadata, the useful metadata that the cell in one itself will collect. Um, so it does, you know, it takes pictures of the cells. If you want to do some image analysis and link it to the proteomics, fruitful avenue for research, have all those images. Um, you know, it's not, you know, it's like the most high, it's not, you know, the most perfect image, but it's, it can provide a lot of information. Um, and people have done some already cool stuff along these lines. Um, you also have just the size is useful to know like what, how much mass spec signal you expect to see. Um, and if there's any fluorescence intensity that you want to record, the fluorescence is the most quantitative thing about the instrument, but you know, you might have cells that are activated, they express RFP or they're not, they're not activated, they won't express it. And, and for especially these kind of qualitative, like on off type things, uh, it's a really great application of the fluorescence um, on the cell in one. Um, so these are all the things the package is intended to do. Well, you need to get started, your search files, we, it's set up for Max Juan or Diane. If people are super interested in searching kind of these types of experiments with like Proteome Discover or Spectronaut, um, essentially the only thing you need to do is kind of change up one of the functions a little bit to kind of read in the data to the right format. So, you know, please like reach out to me or write on GitHub or um, feel free to contribute if, if you find you're using it and are interested. Um, so you need this search data, cell in one isolation files. When you sort the cells, on cell one, as I think maybe you saw this morning, it produces like a little folder. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom of that folder, there's a file that says underscore isolation. This just records where on the slide the cell is dispensed um, and like the diameter and other, other metrics and the name of the image associated with it. Um, so you need that. And then the very last thing you need is this file called the linker. It's a CSV uh, or you know Excel spreadsheet with two columns. The first one is simply the name of the raw file. Uh, and the second one is um, the well that you injected it out of. So file 001 was injected out of A1. Some LC systems are nice. They'll like append that value on the end of the raw file, but there's a bit of heterogeneity in how, how these things are kind of um, added up. For example, the nano loop tells you one to 384. So it's like, uh, it's just easier if, if the user just can kind of, uh, usually it's pretty easy to get this information. So. Um, the most straightforward way is people can just kind of post it in there. So you have the same position on the cell in one? So I mean, the raw file and so, the cell in one position? So the cell in one... Because sometimes you feel, at least with the 96 and see, you feel the mm -hmm. cells. Mm -hmm. so, so the cell in one and the MPOP, it will take the cells from the slide and and we'll put like the first two the first sample it'll put to a1 this they you know then it goes and gets the next one a2 and a3 and so on and so that link like telling the package what well the raw file came from tells you where it came from on the slide essentially and that's kind of all you need to kind of um knowing like where that run came from on the slide is all you need to map all the additional metadata features um so yeah, it's really just three things you need, and um, it it will keep track of you know everything else for you. And it's really immutable because you're putting the samples from the cell and one from the slides into a well. You take the plate and you put it in the auto sampler. And so there's no way you can really mix it up. I mean, with the piece with the Plex DIA experiments, there actually are two plates because you generate 600 samples. You can't fit them all in one 384 old plate. So in those cases, you there's a third column in your linker file that just sets it from plate one or plate two. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's, um, you don't have to kind of dig through, you don't have to kind of keep, I mean, you do have to keep track of what the first or the second plate is, but not too bad, you just write it on the side. Um, and a lot of times, like these things are these, the names of these uh, positions are kind of appended in the raw file. So you could just kind of read in your data and just string subtract out the well position and then, uh, but it's not always there. So I didn't kind of want to make it automatic. Um, what, what time do we have until, does anyone have to schedule? <laughs> okay, so, uh, just to know. 5.30. Okay, 5.30. So okay, we have some time. Uh, and, uh, uh, do you have an example?
sample the linker? Yeah, let's just open one up. Why not? Yeah, this is good. It's 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 super simple. Um, so if you go into the GitHub, so let me just uh, actually real quick. You go on to. Actually, I'll just do this. Okay, so this is just the GitHub folder. So you see, let's open this up. That's great. That's oh, great. Okay, so yeah, three columns, run well plate. And so these were the names. This is like my first run. I don't know. Everyone knows that these raw files end up having strange names. Um, and then this sample was injected out of well B9. This sample injected out of well B10. 11 and all this was all I think I only did one plate so you can see this column is just all ones um, the other important thing and actually the other aspect I didn't mention is that you do want to order this in order of when you ran the raw files um, with the broker instruments it's really easy because they append this number at the end where like so it's pretty easy to sort these in the, and make sure they're sorted in the correct order because now this is the third you know, 13, 67th run, 13, yes. 68. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of double check that. And I'll explain why this is important in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's a super simple thing to make. It only takes you like, oh, hey, a couple minutes. Um, and so, let's see. Um, so for the flex stuff, mm -hmm. or, or randomizing the labels, mm -hmm. where would that data be? In? Would it be in the isolation files? E, good question. Um, it's actually in it's actually in the field files themselves. Um, and if I look in this is my GitHub repository, and I look in the extra data that I store, I just store the field files for the different plexes that that we support in the back end. Um, so it the the package is using this information, but but of course like. I can store it all here, so you don't need to kind of be grabbing these files every single time. Um, but that's a good question. So if I go into the 29 plex, I can see I have the file for the labels, and and these are like horrific files. Like they're we, we string it, parse them for you because like you don't want to be doing that. And um, and the, the pickup field file um, as well that allows you to see like essentially. Um, and I'll show all this. And so yeah, so this is the, the GitHub page. Um, uh, there's a tutorial which is really useful. You just kind of hear this HTML, you just download this and see here, um, we made this tutorial. Um, that's, um, you know, it tells you again, it has all this information. It's all kind of here. Um, it'll make it really easy. And you actually can follow along with the analysis that we did from the paper. If you wanna, you know, follow along exactly. Analysis from paper, it, you open it, you know, the Plex, the Pisco paper is data is not, finished yet, but, or I published yet, um, but hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, but, you know, we have these files. These are the isolation files that I grabbed from the cell one, so they're all right here in the linker. The, the third thing you need is the report, which is just going to be stored on um, Massive, um, is because it's just too big to kind of keep on GitHub. Um, so you will need to download that, but then you can kind of do the exact analysis yourself. And, and, and um, so, yep. Which one is the next one to Diane file we need to use? Yes, so that would be the report from Diane. Um, yeah. So the report.tsv is kind of the base report it generates with all the information. Good question. And for Max Plon, it would be the evidence file. Evidence. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so it's the report.tsv from Diane and the evidence file. I um, mean, hopefully it should say that. You know. So, yeah, it'll tell you kind of everything you need. Um, uh, And there's some links additionally here. Um, so it has the information as well as so installing the package. I didn't talk much about that. Um, hopefully it'll be part of something more official one day, but for now you can just use DevTools, install GitHub, and just type the link of the repository and it, and it should install for you. There's a couple of dependencies that are listed. You can find all the information here. Um, and so, if you include an output path, so where you would want the file to be generated, um, you can generate these reports, which are kind of useful, hopefully will be useful to you. So let's just see, go here. Um, IQ 
can't this happen to me earlier? The zoom things. Um, so yeah, so just we're going to do some live analysis here. We have the data path that I have. It's on Google Drive, so this is a really long path. My linker, which is just in this GitHub folder that's on my desktop, and also these isolation files. Take these isolation files and put them into a list, a named list. So we can see pretty straightforwardly, like one should refer to melanoma, and then so I just call it that. And you could just name these whatever you want, but um, essentially just to simplify the inputs to the function. So I have a list which is just storing the file paths, just the strings to the file path for these three things. Then I have my output path. I want to put it in my desktop. And there's this generate report function, which I'll just run. So it's going to read in the information. It, it, there's just a R. Has anyone have, uh, worked with like R markdown? Yeah, you have there's like a knit button and it just takes everything and throws it into a PDF. So it's like nothing very fancy. There's just like a markdown buried in, in one of the GitHub files and it'll just take stuff and, and it kind of runs through um, and takes a couple seconds to, to, to go. Um, but at the end, um, you get this so report.html, which I printed to my desktop and now I have it here. Uh, let it go to convince you that it won't crash. Okay. Um, cool. It's doing its stuff. Okay. Output. Cool. It's there. So I can see I, it was already here because I had already done it, but open it up. Anyway, so here's kind of what these reports look like. Um, there's a little bit of information for you. The precursor ID is in the run. And as, so this was the reason why it's important to kind of get that ordering right in your linker file. This was the first mass spec run. Um, because we want these things to kind of be, so just to, just to monitor any LC aberrations that might be happening. A lot of times if you have big experiments and you have hundreds of runs, you will see like, I don't know, the column got unhappy, then maybe the spray gets a little bit weird and you want to see something that you want to, so if you're checking this as you go um, and searching your data as you go, it might be useful to kind of see um, that, yeah, um, that there's a dip. And so you also can look at that by like, MS1 intensities, you know, identification is not the only relevant metric, uh, and MS2 fragment intensities. You can also look at the retention time drift. Um, this is just taking kind of the average retention time for intersecting peptides. You can see like there's a bit of run-to-run -run variation, but it's not too bad. And also the deviation, this is like the standard deviation and the retention time distribution uh, across your samples. Um, so you do kind of originally see weird things and it's kind of, it can just tip you off to weird batch effects in your data if you see, and, and we'll get into this a bit more. There's also these cell in one info files. So this is a bit, a bit hard to see what you're looking at, but so this is, um, I'm actually printing out the contents of what's on the slide in that you're looking at in the cell in one. So you can see you have these spacings. There's like one, two, three cells. So these are actually part of a set, this A1, these three cells get picked up and put in well A1. So if you were looking at your pictures like Josh was showing you probably earlier today, and you saw, you know, on slide two on the last field, some of the cells were missing. Maybe debris came into the nozzle. And we don't want to waste the mass spec time. We don't want to run them. You can look at this plot and see, okay, that's G12, G13, and G14. I just skipped those because uh, it does it's maybe not going to be so useful. And you can see the kind of cell types here. Um, we also can kind of look at the labeling scheme if we wanted. Now you'll notice what's going on here. There's only two. And, and so this one is going to be a negative control. We just didn't dispense a cell there. Um, that's because we, we actually weirdly did dispense the label and the trypsin. Um, but we just, for this multiplexing workflows, for label free, it, it's kind of like you don't dispense a cell. We're probably not going to get any like intensity. Um, but for these multiplex workflows, um, it's kind of an additional component that you want to be careful of um, and, and just kind of check that it's signal you're getting is not um, super noisy um, and not just kind of integrating the noise. Here. I have a question. It might be a naive question, but mm -hmm. like considering what we saw this morning as the salon was like dispensing cell into three dots, right? And then um, the label was added, like mm -hmm. for example, G1, G2, G3. Um, in this set of your, uh, your experiments, like as the cells in the sample tube, 
how did it know like this is already like the three types of cells that you have out there mm. like my understanding is that like um when you have cells from like one two and it's this thing in three dots mm -hmm. so um if you have uh, so in this experiment, I had three different tubes of cells. I oh, did okay. three different dispenses. Okay. Yes. If, if the cells are homogenous, uh, yes. if you, you have like a, so like in the data I showed earlier with, um, the, from that trachea tissue, yep. those cell types I annotated, there was only one cell of tube, but the cell in one didn't tell me. Here it was like, I was using cell lines in mm -hmm. my experiment and I literally, like, I know I dispensed these cell I lines. See. I know, okay. Yeah. So good question. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. been misleading for sure. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, of course, it'd be nice to have that automatic annotation of your cell types. Um, maybe <laughs> someone will come to that soon. Um, so here's the more interesting statistics here. We can look at our negative controls. Um, it looks like the signal is kind of about tenfold lower than our single cells here. Um, again, we talked about, um, I talked a bit about this kind of like channel Q value. Um, when I did this report, let's see, I set this channel Q value to one. So I essentially am not filtering at all. Are not being stringent in any way. Um, if your analysis is pretty averse to false positives, like you're doing marker identification in, in cancer or cells or normal cells, you would want to like crank this value down um, to like 0 0.01 or something so you don't end up um, incurring. Because and, and if I were, we'll, I'll go through it and run it line. You can also run it line by line, um, which I'll kind of show you in a bit. But uh, these will kind of drop out entirely if you're more stringent with that value. Um, and so you can look at things. Some of this is a bit crammed and I need to fix the axis. But I think it's hard to tell because it's all together. But this is like 3,200 proteins. And I think the median is maybe somewhere around 3,300 proteins um, per single cell in this data set that we acquired. These two blue and red distributions, is this if you set a stricter channel Q value? Say I set mine to one, which is the most lenient. There's a bit of difference in these distributions because I think some get NAs. Um, because it had a hard time computing, which is probably close to a one. Um, but if you set something like 0.05, um, you would obviously see this red distribution. It would say 0.05 channel Q value, and it would be you know somewhere over here because um, it would filter out more stuff. Um, same with the precursors, and this is totally illegible. Sorry. Um, also really useful the data completeness. Um, so across all of our single cells, we identified a total of 5,259 proteins. Um, now this bar over here, so this is, so in uh, for 2000 or 1700 proteins, we identify them in every single cell that we analyzed in the data set. For these, you know, some proteins in the middle, you know, there's about, you know, say here, there's 200 proteins that were identified in half of the cells. There's some proteins down here where we only have identified them in a small minority of cells. And that can be kind of for a number of reasons. Similarly, this is the converse. So if we have 5,000 cells in the data, proteins in the data set, on average, a cell is getting about 60% of those proteins, which again, is just gonna correspond to this distribution. It's a little bit less informative. Um, you will skip that for a second. So here is the, this is this x-axis is the size of the cell. Um, and that's the cell in one measure. This is the diameter. Um, and we here plotting the kind of sum, I just take all the peptides identified and sum it um, as like the total amount of mass spec signal that we're getting. Um, and you see there's a really strong correlation here. Um, you know, there's also off diagonals. You might kind of wonder things that like what happened there. Um, there's obviously gonna be noise in these measurements. You could have an oblong cell. We're using a single diameter. Uh, we could be a bit better. They give an elongation so we could get better approximations of the cell volume. But generally protein content will scale linearly with the cell volume. Um, not for all proteins, but, you know, not for histones, but more if their cells are in G1 or something. Um, but I think this strong correlation was a good indicator to us of the consistency of the sample prep. Um, you, you know, you want to see that you're getting more signal if the cell is seven times as large, right? Like, um, and so I don't think this speaks necessarily to the efficiency of the sample prep because we could be operating at 20% efficiency very consistently and see this, but I, you know, I, I think it's um, more likely that we're kind of driving into a high efficiency and, and also it seems to be kind of um, consistent within that. Um, we can look at principal component analysis. 
We can visualize the principal component analysis by different things that might cause batch effects. I didn't do any batch correction here. You can see maybe there's some variability within the model sites, or I think I actually mislabeled this when I ran. I think these are supposed to be, but you can see there's a bit of variability on, um, we also can apply a batch correction um, on the individual labels, which, which um, you might want to do. Um, uh, also by the run order, you want to check this. Um, you, you know, I will talk a little bit about a step we took to kind of do some batch correction here, but you know, if something happens in the LC, you will kind of sometimes see some signal, um, but it's pretty easily correctable. You can look at the total cell intensity. I think these are actually the monocytes, which are the smallest ones that we analyzed. And I think these PDAC cells we had were the biggest ones um, and somewhere in the middle here. So these are just some things that you might be interested in looking at, giving a, a, getting a quick, quick uh, glance of. You can also run it line by line. Um, so if I just kind of wanted to have it in my R so I could access it. Um, and actually while we're here, let me just go. So you're gonna generate some this object here that's app note, named app note, but it's like one of these um, S4 objects. So if I look at it and I wanna see kind of what the different things that are in it, I can type at and, and see all the different attributes. Um, what time is it? Oh, you yeah, have another, I think. Uh, um, so we have like the MS type, what, what's the experiment, the Plex, how many tags do we use? Because these things matter for like doing the cell in one mapping. Um, the raw data is just what you read in from Max1 or Diane. We do only pick the columns that are important because we don't want to crash your R with a bunch of useless data that we're not going to use. Um, like, you know, there's, there's so many columns in these reports and you, you don't need them all to do most analyses. Um, Matrices that are relevant, we have the kind of peptide matrix unnormalized, uh, and it's like kind of sequence with the charge by single cell, so the precursor. Um, the protein that we normalize, protein that we have imputed, we saw like the apps protein, like absolute intensities. Um, as most of you know, there's actually a lot of um, absolute intensities are generally a bit less accurate to compare because there's you know ionization differences from peptide to peptide. Um, but you can get somewhat accurate with these things within kind of you have it, you know, maybe twofold if you're measuring many peptides, or generally people say it's like row within tenfold. But the more the intro, the things that we're usually more doing are these relative um, normalized, we're kind of normalized to relative levels, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then some metadata, you have a metadata data frame, which is kind of the sample um, that you're, you know, if you had two conditions, what the conditions were, or if you have different cell types from cell culture, what, what those like we had here, the label, the MS run, the cell ID, and so. The columns of these matrices are the cell ID. It should be like an immutable way to identify each cell and it's just the well plate it came from, uh, what well in the plate. So, you know, plate one, well A1, label zero. And, and so these should be like, no matter how many times you run the thing, these are kind of immutable identifiers for your single cells. Um, uh, and then maybe some, you know, these run order statistics we talked about with intensity is a silver run order and then the reductions if you did a PCA or a UMAP. Um, Just one question. Yeah. What's the protein abundance? Uh, absolute. Uh, this is with protein abundances, but like not normalized. So there's still some interesting information you want to know, like what the most abundant protein is. It's the abundance. Yes. Yeah, so, not a absolute, right? Um, yeah. So... Um, it's, I guess, it's the abundance without any normalization, I suppose. So it's just the, I think, what is it? Maybe like max LFQ style intensity is uh, of each protein. Um, so if you have a bigger cell, kind of all the proteins will be kind of larger and, and, and actin will be your highest protein and some transcription factor will be lower. Uh, yeah, so for, for people who um, are, just want to kind of not have normalized data if they're interested in kind of running this, um, but they don't, they're not necessarily comfortable with the normalization choices or they want to use their own normalization. Um, you can either work from the peptides matrix, which is just literally the raw values or this absolute, which is kind of max LFQ from the peptide level, um, if that makes sense. Um, but good question, for sure. Uh, so yeah, so here's this, we can kind of, we can increase these filters, this channel Q value filters by maybe up that down that to 0.1, it's a bit more stringent. Um, this is a kind of, so you can run it line by line as well, link it. Um, 
to the sum one manual data. I again can kind of plot these layouts over the slide that we kind of looked at earlier. Uh, okay, and um, again, can evaluate the negative controls. This will look a bit different than the last one we had because I was a bit more stringent on the filtering. So yeah, now the single cells are around eight and these negative, so they've dropped to almost two orders of magnitude where they were kind of one before. And if I you know, up that to like 0.05 or 0.1, they probably would go all the way to zero or so. Um, and then I would can filter at some minimum intensity threshold. Maybe I pick seven. So say there were some single cells that were down here that didn't look so good. Uh, I would maybe want to filter them out. Um, but I'll just choose 7.5 here because it looks like that's a good way to divide the negative controls from the cells. Um, again, we can kind of plot this. We saw before, it's nice. And then here we're collapsing to protein level. So this will take a quick second. Um, let me just, I can just tell you um, about some of the normalization changes, choices that we make to get to this collapse of the protein level. Um, so first, if a reference sample is used, either like in a scope DIA style experiment or if you have TMT with a reference channel, well, the first step we do is we divide the raw peptide intensities by that. But, um, reference channel. Um, then we divide each cell by the median intensity of kind of all the peptides. So it's kind of like a uh, cell size normalization. We kind of want to get, if you have a bigger cell, it's going to look like everything's more abundant, but we're interested really in concentrations, not most of the time. I mean, there's a lot of things you might be interested in, but generally we are interested in the concentration. So we do want to do these scaling for size. And then additionally, We'll divide each peptide by the mean intensity across the row. And this is to kind of get everything on relative scaling. Um, and if you're doing analyses like PCA, this is kind of centering the data in this way is kind of like a requirement for some of these algorithms. And again, this is certainly like not one size fits all for all these things. It's it's whatever, you know, depends on the analyses you're interested in. And, and these are just kind of the choices that we were doing most commonly. Um, and, and so these are the ones that are implemented for your quality control plots. Uh, LC correction. Sometimes you have some weird LC stuff happening. Maybe one of your B uh, buffer pumps gets a bit off. Maybe you injected a really wacky sample that through your chromatography for a loop. And so you can have these things. I mean, this is the worst example I ever found and most of the ones look pretty flat. Um, but to just I I explain one additional normalization step we do, um, essentially to reduce, you don't want any variance essentially related to the run order uh, in which you ran your LCMS runs. Um, the last sample should not look systematically different from the first, presumably, unless you have a poor experimental design and, you, and your conditions are changing in time as you run them. Um, and, and, you know, if you wanted to compare the things, you know, if you want to compare the first sample to the last sample, then you, know, you should try to intersperse your um, samples, I guess. Um, and so we're just fitting a we're just fitting a spline to this. Uh, the x-axis variable is just the run order, and the y-axis is just your relative peptide abundance for each peptide. Um, you know, and then we just are subtracting this median. And after we fit this line, it kind of straightens everything out and re removes variance related to things correlated with the run order, which again we think are artifacts. Now this is like a particularly bad example. Um, you can explore these things a little bit for yourselves and see if you find these. Most of the time they're not there, but yeah, again, this is like the worst example I ever found. And you can see like this was over the course of 300 runs. Um, yeah, essentially loops through every peptide and computes this regression. And if the regression here, the regression coefficient was like 0.9, um, for the majority of them, it's like below 0.1 in there, it doesn't perform any correction. But everything that might be weird, it just tries to straighten it out a little bit. Um, and it, I think in terms of the degrees of freedom, I try to be a bit more conservative, so we're not overcorrecting. But anyways, these are useful choices. We And the the nice check on this is that, I didn't go over this plot too much, but we found that after applying this, peptides from the same protein correlated to each other much more strongly, um, which was good to see. Um, so then after that, we'll collapse these relative measurements to the protein level and we'll kind of log to transform. Most of this protein data is log normally distributed. So it helps to kind of have this on the log scale. Um, and then if you want, we have an imputation step that's optional. You can do PCA without the imputation. You also could do a UMAP without imputation if you just 
computing your covariance matrices on the pairwise. So only for the values that are in common between two single cells. Um, but we have a KNN impute function. So let's see. Yeah, so you can run all these things kind of. And so this is just to really remark on a plot that I really, really, really like. Um, and I think it's super useful. Um, so, okay. So what we're doing here is we're correlating peptides that come from the same protein across single cells. And we're faceting each of these distributions by how variable the protein is. So essentially, if you have you know, a bunch of single cells, and there's two different types of single cells, and you have a protein that's only specific to one of them, essentially, it's gonna, you're going to look something like this. It's going to be you know, high, low, high, low. And if you have two peptides from that protein, you're going to get high. They're both going to be high, then both low, then both high across these different single cell types. And so if that protein is really variable, the correlation should be much stronger because you have a lot of signal. It should be easy to get a good correlation, essentially. But if you have two proteins that you know, are not changing at all across cells, you picture two flat lines. It's kind of like, what's the correlation between two flat lines? If you inject even the smallest amount of noise, essentially your correlation is zero. Um, so this is a really good um, way to kind of get a sense for the signal to noise in your data. Um, and just, you know, uh, it's a bit of a complicated plot, to be honest. But uh, generally, if you're measuring two peptides from the same protein, they should probably more likely than not agree with each other. Of course, there's a lot of edge cases, um, all sorts of edge cases that are really interesting. And, and maybe some of these data points down here are interesting things, right? Maybe there's a high fractional site occupancy of phosphorylation, and this peptide you know, protein down here has two peptides and one of them is phosphorylated most of the time. And the phosphorylation <laughs> state changes from the regular. And so it's, they're not all, I mean, I would reckon to say probably a lot of these are just kind of noisy data, but you know, some of them might very well be interesting things. Um, um, so here's the imputation function. You can batch correct on labels. Um, you, there's a couple options here. Um, run, it would be to correct on every single run, which you certainly do not want to do with Plex DIA style experiments. In the very past, uh, this was kind of implemented before we I implemented the spline pit that I showed earlier. So it's probably always going to be false. Um, and the labels, you can see if you need to do this or not based on the quality plots. And if you can see the separation on the PCA, chances are you might want to add it. Um, there can be slightly different kind of um, some, some, some small biases there that it's really easy to correct out with the most simple algorithms. It's only three covariates and you have a lot of data. Um, so we can compute the PCA, I think. Yeah. So the option for imputing equals false. Uh, a lot of the documentation should be kind of on GitHub that needs to probably be improved. So that, and I can plot it by a very variety of things. You saw these plots already. Um, so that's kind of, you know, it, certainly it's an aspiration is not to be comprehensive, but it was a byproduct of generating these reports and, and it might be useful for some people. If you, you want to get the, so now say I want to do my own analyses, I can go, you know, map node at matrices and then within there, there's my protein matrix and I can maybe view it if I want, or I can you know, set it to a new variable, save it as a CSV, do any other analyses I might be interested in. Um, and, you know, um, so maybe potentially have some interest. And just to wrap up here, I know it's been a long day. We're getting, I only have a couple more slides. Um, so as I said, obviously this like normalization of cell size by the median intensity of the cell is not perfect. There's no perfect normalization really, uh, unless you thought exhaustively uh, explained every situation and, and all of its context. Um, but, you know, this is some work recently published from the Scotheme lab who they're really interested at Stanford. They're really interested in the effect of cell size in the proteome, have a lot of interesting work. Um, I actually was a reviewer for this paper and they analyzed some of our single cell data and showed that a lot of proteins were correlated to the cell size. An example of this is histone concentration, right? If you have a big cell, and it's in G1 or a small cell that's in G1 and you do this normalization, it's gonna seem like histones 
are, um, you know, less concentrated in the bigger cell because um, it's divided kind of by a bigger scalar. But obviously, like, that's not really an interesting thing that we want in our data. We know that cells are going to have histones proportional to the amount of DNA. You know, we don't probably want to see that. Um, and so you're going to have things like surface proteins, right? These scale with the surface area and not the volume. So they're also going to subscale a little bit. Um, and so you might want to correct some of these things in your normalization. It's a bit hard. If you have a very homogeneous population of cells, you can implement something to, to adjust for these quite easily. But if you have a complex mixture of cells, you know, you might have a, a specific protein that's specifically expressed, but also expressed in the largest cell type. So you could see like, you don't necessarily, you know, you cannot necessarily associate it with cell size. So it might not be, you know, you know, you don't want to just apply some ad hoc normalization algorithm. If it's correlated with size, we regress out the size correlation. So it's, it's a bit, so these are, again, I just wanted for computationally minded folks who are interested to work on different avenues for single cell data analysis. This is something that's suboptimal that something to come up with a better solution for that we certainly have not implemented. Um, the other one, the big one, everyone always asks, what about missingness? What about imputation? This is super common. Um, so there's obviously different types of imputation. Some of it is missing at random, where if it's missing, that tells you nothing. In these cases, you're kind of up creek. You don't have much things you can, I mean, you maybe will apply KNN and that's kind of the best you can do. You really you don't have a lot of information. Um, you also can have missing not at random where the fact that it's missing tells you potentially something interesting. So if you have two cells, cell one and cell two, and they're about the same size, um, and you know here's mock protein values. Um, here you'll see like protein two, whatever reason is three in cell one, and, and this protein three, I guess, is two in cell two. But on average, the cells seem to be the same size. Maybe our mass spec limit of detection is four, right? So if it's under four copies, we actually can't count it. So there's NAs. Now, if the cells are the same size, uh, roughly, you kind of, it's really, you know, this is very informative because this NA tells you that, wow, this cell is the same size as this other one. And in this other cell of the same size, we were easily able to detect this protein, but not in this cell. So chances are that that protein has a low concentration in this cell one versus cell two. And so here's doing something like imputing with a small number is a good approach because you know that the concentration of that protein is low. The cells are the same size and it was here and it wasn't here. So it's really a lot of it, it's, it's very useful. This is not missing at random, this is missing for a reason. Um, but what about if the cells are different sizes, right? If there's a bigger cell, we saw that plot that we made, right? Cell size, total MS signal versus volume and it's very strongly correlated. So the biggest cell, all the proteins are gonna be more abundant, right? So, you know, if we have, again, this limit of detection of four, but the average size here is much larger, six versus four. And now we are seeing our imputation, you know, our, you know, we're gonna have more missing values in this smaller cell, but it doesn't necessarily tell us that the concentration is reduced. So we wanna be a bit careful about, about how we impute small values in there, um, because, you know, at the end of the day, we're interested in, you know, mostly, uh, I guess from my, and, and this isn't always true, but I guess from my perspective, we're interested in looking at concentrations of proteins and, um, you know, it, the value is missing because, you know, maybe it's at a normal concentration, the same concentration as in the bigger cell, but because the bigger cell is bigger, it gets us just over that limit of detection. And we know that now we can see that protein, but we have a lot of uncertainty about it in the smaller cell. So all these things, not things we, I have answers to, things people will hopefully develop good answers to. Um, and this is kind of a benefit versus single cell RNA sequencing in some ways, because I think this cell size is really informative and, and this relationship between protein abundance and cell size is much stronger in the protein data than in the transcript data. I have a question. Sure, Would yeah. be the different cell type? This would be because same cell type would be the similar size of the cell, right? Um, you have a lot of variation um, in, in, in I, uh, so if we look here, and we go, what's it? Okay. Okay. So if we look at this, I can zoom maybe, or maybe it won't let me. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, exactly. But you see, yeah, the green, there's big yeah. green cells up here all the way even, oh, and no, it's all the way down here, or even the blue cell, you know. That's a, and this access is, the, is this is log two volume. So a, a red dot here is, and a red dot here, this is, there's a two X difference in volume. So maybe the limit of detection, we're right straddling the edge of it. If we have twice as big of a cell, we have twice as much protein, we're over that limit of detection. Now we can see this protein. Um, so it's a good point. I, I, sometimes that will be the case, certainly, but even within a cell type, there's a lot of variation. Um, uh, Do you, is, there, is there any difference between uh, the uh, imputation by small number versus imputation by normal distribution? Do you see which one would you prefer? Um, so, okay, so by small number would be we have two cells of the same size. We see it's missing in one cell and not the other. So that tells us that, and you know, it depends what numbers you're imputing. If, if you're imputing a concentration, um, then you you know you the cells are the same size and it's not in this cell. We want to put a small. We know that that concentration is lower in this cell than the one where we do recognize it because it's not related to like the larger cell has more protein simply because it's larger and it got us over that limit of detection. So that would be a good so, uh, case for imputing a small value um, in the matrices of like concentrate like you know everything's normalized to kind of concentrations. Um, uh, so if a value is missing at random. So say it's like um, we it's missing, but uh, certain circumstances just because it's missing, it doesn't mean that it it's, has a small concentration in that cell. This is more of a case for doing something like imputing from a normal distribution. Um, you also could do imputing from like K nearest neighbors, which is a another you know I tend to prefer that slightly more than from a normal distribution. But normal distribution, of course, is the most conservative thing you can do. The other thing which I prefer more than both of those is just trying to look at the analysis on like on pairwise observations that are agreed between the th and that also has its own downsides. So, um, but if you if you um, want to correlate, you know, if you want to correlate these two vectors, I could just well actually ten and twelve are the only ones paired here I have I guess, but here I could just correlate ten seven to twelve seven. Right, mm -hmm. and that would be excluding things where one of them is missing. This is also an option. So there's a lot of options, and, and it's not one size fits all. There's a lot of considerations. Is there? Uh, can you use some like housekeeping protein to do like internal normalization? A great question. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, a good example of this um, is something like. Um, like get get DH. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of variation in. in right yeah, in yeah. No, I mean, it depends on kind of what you're trying to do. There, there's a, there can even be a lot of variation in, in some of these mm -hmm. housekeeping proteins. And, and I think, I mean, a good example is like you sometimes people normalize to the histone abundance. Um, yeah, because the cells go through the cell cycle, so they have different histone abundances. Yeah, yeah for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're interested in doing something like, um, you know, and there's certain analyses where the absolute copy number is more important than the concentration that you're doing. And in these cases, um, normalizing to kind of by the histones can give you a better sense of, because if you have two cells, you should assume that their histone numbers, roughly speaking, are the exact same, kind of they're both in G1. Um, so you can use this histone concentration normalization to kind of try and exclude noise that might be from one cell is not prepared as efficiently as the next. And that would result in variable histone amount. But you might want to do a first normalization to kind of, yeah, there's a lot of work that still can be done and not stuff that I've really implemented. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, it's kind of a, for anyone who's followed RNA-seq, there's been about 17,000 papers on, on these things. And, and I imagine there'll be many, many, many papers on these things for as, as more protein data sets become available. Um, Speaking of which, when people started, is there a way to spike in like an orthologous organism? Yeah, the, absolutely, great question. Let's go to, and so now I, let me just finally say before I answer your question, uh, I'm not gonna get into this. There's lots of additional stuff you might wanna do. 
the data can be found at the Slab Lab Lab website along with tons of protocols and for the stuff you saw today, like all the specific information. Um, and, and okay, so, well, I'm not sharing. Um, well, there was nothing there I said at all. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can pull up some of these things just to show. And, and so uh, at this point, we're pretty much done, but I guess I have 10 minutes, so. Okay, so here's the paper for the prioritized um, mass spectrometry, and I want to orient you. So, so here's, I guess, the benefit of, so, so by the way, someone asked about inclusion lists versus the max quant live. So we found that the prioritize, you can see all the things in this paper, we found the prioritization improved performance over kind of a regular inclusion list without the prior, and you can see the things in the hot, oh, uh, this is too complicated to explain to you. I guess you can see eventually. But your question about spike-ins. So in these experiments, and this is a part of the protocol that you didn't see today because we haven't kind of worked out the most standardized thing to prescribe. But a, one thing we did for this paper is we bought, uh, we synthesized yeast peptides that had one single like lysis. So I think we had four different peptides and they had one each peptide had one either lysine or arginine internally. And we spiked in these four peptides, we dispensed them on the slide, and they just kind of dried out. And then we started the prep exactly as you saw today, all the same steps, exactly the same. And then we looked for these spiked in peptides in our single cell data. We spiked them in at 16 fold dynamic range. And uh, you can see the abundance of them relative to the rest of the peptides in the single cell. Definitely on the high end. Uh, on average, they were about in the top, you know, so I would say in the 77th percentile or 66, or, yeah, maybe somewhere over here. Um, but the abundance range certainly would be representative of like a somewhat more abundant peptide. Um, and all the way down, again, like all the way down, we have this lowest bin is going to be things that were kind of on the lower end of, of peptides that were quantifying the single cells. And, and, and so this was an experiment. Uh, to your point, it's a great idea, and this can give you a really good uh, understanding of like how much variation between two cells comes from inefficiencies in sample prop, and how much variation comes from um, just natural variation in the cell size and in different proteins that you might be interested in studying. Uh, any other questions? I, I, you've had a really uh, long uh, day, so thanks for kind of sticking with us, and hopefully you guys learned some interesting stuff. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I have a quick question regarding a match between runs for this kind of yeah. single cells. Yeah. Do you prefer to run with match between runs, or yeah, uh, because they're not exactly the replicates if you have the different ones? Yeah, it's a question. Um, so for the DIA data, Diane does not implement a very sophisticated match between runs. They actually like don't really do much of it. They, they you can there's an MBR button, but all it does is it shrinks the library based mm -hmm. off everything you identified in the first set, which is you know in a manner of speaking, I guess some form of. But it's not really. Uh, Spectrum not does something much more comprehensive. They will like I think. Maybe, you know, but they, I think they, like, they'll actually like get a peptide in one run and then like look for it. Yeah, the so they do, but right. they create a library, sub-library with your runs and then, so you have each individual run that's analyzed mm -hmm. and then it, I guess, make a comprehensive library of every single cell, then rematch it and then you find something. So it's not really much between run like you oh, okay. mean it in, in yeah. uh, DDA. Mm. Uh, okay. Because that's just the feature oh, so. of DIA, right? Like a matrix in DDA is different because you yeah. okay. you cannot force it because you can miss peptide just because they were not yeah, identified it's... because of abundance. When right. with DIA, okay. you yeah. try to rematch feature. It just right. Yeah. I don't think it does. Anything okay, it doesn't do that. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good. Um, okay, so good to know. I suppose. Yeah. Then I guess yeah, we get we get very similar number with Diane match between run and I spectral okay. as normal. And how about with the max quant one? I haven't tried. Okay. Uh, I and so far, I haven't heard like great things about the DA version. So. I think, but the version, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think it needs a bit of uh, tightening up, software-wise. But 
Um, you have been working with Max Point for the Plex DIA, right? No, for the um, TMT yeah. workflows, right? Yeah, um, which is the only search engine I've ever really used for DDA. Um, but like Frag Pipe also is really important. Or, I mean, DDA search is kind of at this point pretty yes. like well, and also uh, underpowered compared to what you could do. I mean, I mean, DIA search engines take in much more information. They do predictions of spectra. They do use the retention time to aid the identification and all these things. Um, Max wants just kind of implementing, I forget what the mascot or whatever the algorithm is that just kind of matches against the database. And it's fairly, like, it's almost like pretty rudimentary, like compared to like what you could be doing these days. But, and I think probably like Peru Young Discover or does something more sophisticated and they probably use machine learning um, to like improve these predictions of spectra and retention times and all these things. Um, but with the prioritized scope, if you can increase your kind of fractional identification rate, um, so the number of, if you're taking 100 MS2 scans and, and you can be productive on 88% of them, you know, there's opportunity for an additional 12% gain or something. But, um, uh, or I guess that's not exactly right percentages wise, but anyways, there's additional, you know, some room for improvement, but it's not like a, something where match between runs can like twofold improve your results. Um, for DIA analyses, sometimes it can really be a big, a big help. Um, Have you ever tried uh, the max quant live option to exclude, like when you were talking about the well, Okay. So if you don't do DDA, you don't care because you're fragmenting like a certain mass range. So that's also the advantage that uh, um, if you record your data with DIA, you will greatly um, benefit from like software improvements uh -huh. because you, the data is there. So if you if the software gets just better at picking up like the data from the noise, then if you run your data set, like so for example, now there's New version of spectral coming, you can run your whole data set and get uh, so that they say you now get mm -hmm. better quantification data. Sure. Yeah. Um, so with D with DDA, it don't get that that much better because the you you get your yeah. peak, uh, detect them on MS1, you fragment them, and then that's just what you do. So yeah. if it's missed, it's missed. You will never mm -hmm. get it again. Um, yeah. Then of course you can improve the identification on MS2, but it, it don't get like that much better than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have a really high fractional ID rate, then um, you're kind of maxing out. Yeah, there's a hard threshold on how useful you, and you can't match between runs with TMT if you don't fragment it. Um, but still, you know, I think if you're running like, if you want to go a bit slower, you can um, do good, good quantification for like, um, let's see. Oh, I don't have it. But if you go a bit slower, you can do like really great quantification for like two plus thousand proteins per cell and have uh, benefit from like the really high throughput of the TMT tag. I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. If you have a complex sample and you want to kind of profile protein differences between the different cell types and maybe compare them to transcript abundances like Toxod and Megan gave, um, if you saw at the conference, um, these kind of analyses like DDA can still be really nice with the high multiplexing. Um, if you want to build more like precise quantitative models of, of protein abundance or, and your signal to noise that you need is higher and you want to use more proteins to model and you, and you have nice cell, like larger cells, then a DIA definitely has some advantages. Um, but the trade-offs, and, and again, we are using both a bunch uh, and there's, uh, I think they're kind of very synergistic uh, and you also have different noise structures in the two data sets. Like there's different um, sources of kind of reasons your quant might be not as good. So if you have good agreement, some I mean, a lot of thing we're doing a lot is collecting the both from both the same cell types and then comparing the results. And if they agree strongly, it gives you a significantly more confidence that the quant is what the quant is, I guess. Similar to like looking at multiple peptides from the same protein. Sweet. All right. Uh, you're all free, I suppose. <laughs> I think I have counted for long enough. Yes. Okay.